We have a motion to second to reconvene an open session. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion to authorize the town administrator to execute the opioid settlement agreement. Second. We have a motion to second uh, for the town administrator to execute the opioid settlement agreement. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, motion to authorize the town administrator to execute the West Main Road negotiating agreement. Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have an opposed, so Wendy, please note that. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience while we were in executive session. Um, oh, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, motion, go ahead, Tom. Motion to seal the executive session minutes pursuant to section 42467 of Rhode, Rhode Island general law. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right, excellent. Um, so let's move on to number two. It's uh, pre budget um, consultation. Number two, just let me read it in. Uh, pursuant to section 16.2. Dash 21, pre-budget consultation annual reports, appropriation requests, slash budgets. Um, A, at least 60 days, but not more than 90 days prior to the formal submission of the school budget to the appropriate city or town officials by the school committee. There shall be a joint pre-budget meeting between the school committee and the um, city or town councils at or before this meeting. Number two, uh, the highest elected official of the city or town Shall submit, shall, shall submit to the school committee an estimate prepared in, man, in a manner approved by the Department of Administration of, pro, of projected revenues for the next fiscal year. In the case of the property tax, the projection shall include only changes in the property tax base, not property tax rates. The school committee shall submit to the town, to the, uh, to the city of town, a council, a statement for the next ensuing fiscal year of anticipated total revenues, project enrollments with the resultant staff and facility requirements, and any necessary or mandated changes in school programs or operations. Motion to begin the pre-budget consultation pursuant to 16-2-21. Second. The motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Mr. Brown. Uh, good evening, uh, and thank you for scheduling uh, the pre-budget consultation tonight. We have a presentation prepared similar to prior years that both myself and the superintendent will provide you this evening. And as the council president read, it includes uh, information that's required by statute. Uh, and then over the years, uh, both the school department and town have added additional information, which is become part of the critical decision making we make uh, when we consider the upcoming budget. So if we can just go to page, the first page. This is a, a summary of what the council president just read, uh, basically summarizing the law that requires us to have this discussion. I just, wait one sec. Okay, uh, Matt Shealy just wants to make sure we're, we're on. Uh, he's not able to be here tonight. Uh, the related on general law 16-2-21 uh, is the statute that requires this discussion. As the council president stated, uh, it, the meeting takes place 60 days, but not more than 90 days prior to the formal submission of the school budget. And the topics that we'll discuss tonight on the town side, projected revenues for the next fiscal year, and the school superintendent and the school committee will talk about anticipated total expenditures, projected enrollments, staff and facility requirements, estimated enrollment and payments to charter schools, and uh, finally mandated changes to school programs and operations. So they really have areas to cover this evening. First thing on the next slide, I'm gonna go through the slides that the, the town is mostly responsible for, and that's talking about the revenues. Uh, anticipated revenues for the upcoming year are Two percent uh, decrease from the year that we're presently in. 
And what I'll do is quickly walk through those uh, decreases. Um, and those will be represented by decreases in both the town and the school. So next slide. Just going to hit on some of the highlights. What this chart shows is on the town side, the general fund, where the decreases are. Uh, the first major decrease is $307,000 in use of fund balance. Uh, basically, that's the, again, this is on the town side. Uh, we have non recurring shortfalls uh, in our revenue related to COVID. In prior years, we were funding revenues related to hotel tax and meals tax. Uh, from fund balance uh, just because there has been a decrease in revenue coming into the town and for the up we're projecting that uh, we will be back to a normal revenue stream and not be reliant on using fund balance uh, the last item which is significant on here is the 1.2 million dollars 1 million two hundred fifty six thousand dollars and that's the non-recurring lease purchase payment related to the fire pumpers uh, we don't anticipate needing a lease purchase agreement as of now uh, in the upcoming budget so that capital lease proceed line will show zero uh, basically a, a non-recurring uh, revenue stream for a non-recurring purchase <clears throat> the next slide i'm going to quickly run through revenues uh, that are restricted in the school department uh, the first, there's a, a decrease shown of $1.3 million, $1,322,839. And this is the state pro projection for state aid right now. Um, the information that we got from Providence is that we would see a decrease. And that's mostly related to how the school funding formula is reacting because of different um, characteristics uh, in the economy resulting from COVID. Uh, there is a considerable amount of discussion going on between the town and the state, as well as between the school department and the state. And um, I guess the, the cautionary way we're proceeding and, and the feedback we're getting is that uh, this is a statewide problem. Um, there will likely be a statewide solution. And you know, I guess the, the most plausible outcome is, is a hold harmless type scenario where um, we wouldn't see that $1.3 million loss, but we wouldn't see an increase either. Uh, so that seems to be the, the likely outcome. But from an evidence standpoint right now, we're, we're looking at that $1.3 million decrease. Uh, the next line, use of fund balance, $863,000. Uh, the school department had the ability to use fund balance uh, to balance out last year. Um, that was uh, the total amount that was used, $863,000. That amount won't be available uh, in the upcoming budget to fund operations. So that's one of the matters that Mark and I have been working on is trying to figure out how to transition from that use of fund balance, that non-tax revenue over to uh, a tax revenue to support the school operations without interrupting providing services to to students and families uh, the next significant line item uh, use of fund balance bond two million ninety one thousand two hundred eighty one dollars um, those are proceeds uh, from the ten million dollar bond that was passed uh, we've at, come to the point where the school department is has basically completed the projects uh, so we will no longer have that revenue stream, so that will zero out in the upcoming year. Uh, there'll be no associated expense with it, so it sort of balances out. And then lastly, there's a $1,165,882 increase uh, related to federal grants, which would be the projected uh, increase in federal grants related to the ESSER program, uh, which is basically part of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, lastly, uh, the school department shows a decrease in revenues related to the school lunch program, uh, $510,433. Uh, that would be in their enterprise program, so separate and apart from the, uh, the grant program. We can go to the next page. 
talk a little bit about the tax base. This is not a reval year, uh, so the numbers are relatively stable from the prior year. The anticipated tax base is estimated to be $3,662,000,000, which is about a $4,600,000 increase or 0.13% over the prior year. Again, the, the assessments will stay relatively stable because last year was a reval year. Um, the one thing I'll point out is that we have seen a number of values increase related to new homes, subdivision, and condominiums. However, that increase for this period of time is, is offset by the uh, increase in exemptions that were recently approved by the town council um, related to seniors, veterans, and visually challenged uh, property owners. So, so overall, the tax base stays relatively the same. Uh, we will see the continuation of the motor vehicle phase-out program, uh, but, but overall, uh, we're, we're moving sideways when it comes to the value of property between last year and this year. On the next slide, this slide is actually a, a, a statutory disclosure, uh, and when the council president talked about items that were received, he actually signs a letter. Um, and he's only required to disclose the maximum amount of money that can be raised under Rhode Island General Law 16221. Uh, so with the 4% cap, uh, the town can raise a total amount of money of $1,887,386. And specific to the school department, uh, the school committee, without requesting an exemption under the statute, can request one million ninety-eight thousand seven hundred and three dollars. Uh, that would be the the statutory limit on the appropriation the school committee can request. The next slide. Just point out. I think this slide came into the presentation a number of years ago, uh, just because of the. Uh, state aid formula, but it just helps demonstrate what's happened over time in the state support towards the town of Middletown. But the uh, state aid, the, the funding formula was implemented in fiscal year 2012, and then we went through a period of time where, where basically um, the amount of money the town received from the state was phased out. Uh, that phase out has been completed. Uh, and what you can see here is that over time, we still really haven't recovered to pre-formula, the, the pre-formula amount of state aid the town receives. Uh, and I think that's what this slide continues to highlight. Uh, again, that number in 2013, we would expect that to increase by about 1.3 million. Uh, but if you were to sort of take this slide and, and draw a line across it, you can see that over time, uh, revenues are, are decreasing from state um, as, a, as a result of that, that funding change that took place. Uh, so that's, that's what that slide is highlighting this evening. I think with that, I am going to turn it over to the superintendent. She's going to start running through those six items uh, that are specific to school committee disclosures. Good evening. As Sean said, um, we are working at the state level with regard to a whole harmless that we would get at least what we got last year, probably no more, but at least what we got last year. So with the funding formula, there's a number of items that go into the funding formula, success, student success rate and so forth, and given uh, the pandemic and so forth, uh, the state organizations, both the school boards association and the superintendents and principals, and I know the League of City and Towns are, are really pushing for a hold harmless. But at the time that we published this, this was the information that we gave you, so it is the worst case scenario. The next slide, please. Talks about our uh, enrollment and also our um, uh, full-time equivalent staffing. So uh, total staffing is 296.83. You can see uh, that our instructional certified direct instruction, we have 185 teachers. Uh, we have three instructional certified leadership. 
uh, in, the, in the schools that those are our department heads or directors at the high school. Instructional non-certified assistants, these are our teacher assistants, uh, 50.73. Administrative central office are five. Superintendent, assistant superintendent, uh, director of technology, director of facilities, and director of finance. Administrative school base, we have six principals. Maintenance, 24. Clerical, uh, 21. And bus monitors, 1.5. Next slide, please. Again, by law, we are uh, to not only give our staffing, but our enrollment. Now, we use uh, NESDEC for enrollment projections. Um, they do a decent job. They do most of the enrollment projections for all school districts in the Northeast. We do our own enrollment projections. And um, every year, we're probably more on the mark than NESDEC, just because we know the nuances of our community. Navy coming in, Navy leaving, um, uh, the population, the War College. So currently our October enrollment was 2014 students. NESDEC proje projects that we will have 2,076 uh, students, and our projections are around 2,040 students, up a little bit. And these have held over uh, the number of years we've been doing this. Next slide talks about our out-of-district placements. And these are students that are either in charter schools, alternative uh, placements, career tech education, any, any student placed outside of the district. Career and technical education, uh, we have a number of students uh, that attend schools, in, uh, uh, programs outside of uh, our district. We have students that go to Barrington for a career pathway. We have students that go to Portsmouth, Newport, that's obviously the Rogers Volk uh, program, and North Kingston and the Met. Now we'd like to work with uh, our le uh, legislators because some of the students, particularly that go to Barrington and Portsmouth, are going to similar programs that we have here in our, in our district. Uh, the former commissioner of education left, left the um, state open. So if a student really wanted to go to a, a Barrington or a, a Narragansett or whatever for a, a career, program, they are entitled to go to that program. We want to work with the legislators, and of course we want to give our students every opportunity for the quality education that they need and their interests. But we'd like to qualify that, that if we have a current program, say in computer science or biomedical or uh, robotics, that they would not be able to go to another community for those schools. So. Uh, we will bring that up with our local legislators. We have 53 uh, full-time students and 18 part-time students for a total of 71 students. The tuition, that's a big tuition number, uh, eight, eight, um, $8,570 uh, for that. And the tuitions for um, 23 have not been determined yet. They will be determined in the next few weeks. Those that go to charter or alternate or other placement, we have students that attend Kingston Academy, the Compass School, Norwell Academy, CCRI, East Bay Career Academy, and Connections Academy. And we have eight students who attend that for a total of uh, 95,000. Again, the tuitions have not been set, set by the state for those uh, charter schools and outplacement. Next slide. This is the heartbeat of our work in the district. It's our uh, district uh, strategic plan. Uh, we will be updating this uh, in the fall, the end of fall next year, but we have uh, five core strategic plans um, goals that we really follow, and all our decisions are around these five goals. Next slide. 
So when we look at the full-time requests, the school full-time requests that I reviewed with you uh, before, uh, the only positions that would be added would be the ones that we would f uh, fund through ESSER, $3. And we're still finalizing that now, but currently we have scheduled a point four social worker, um, a Middletown continuation of a Middletown High School guidance counselor, a student success teacher at our high school, contracted services for behavioral specialists for Forest Avenue, Aquidneck, and Gauday Learning Academy, um, and Middletown High School. We do have an additional English language learner teacher because our numbers have certainly increased. And we were discussing today with our admins staff the continuation of five building-based subs. If we cannot fund that through the ESSER, $3, we will put it in another grant to uh, cover that and remove it from our operations budget. It's about $108,000. Uh, in addition, a family service coordinator and a translator. These two positions have been invaluable uh, to our school district over the past uh, year. Also, there's a potential for an additional teacher at the high school who would assist students with career opportunities and exploration. Our high school principal submitted a grant to the Rhode Island Foundation um, just yesterday or today uh, for this position. And in addition, um, we would like to uh, have five six-hour teacher assistants to help support our students uh, at the elementary and Gauday Learning Academy next year, funded under ESSA 3. Now, we're very aware of the funding cliff with, uh, with uh, these dollars and these positions, but we have the dollars now. We want to utilize the dollars to maximize the supports for our students. Next slide. Uh, school facilities. All of the 2018 bond projects are substantially completed. That was a great boost to uh, our facilities in Middletown. Uh, dollars well spent and, um, and, as I said, substantially completed. The school department began developing its five-year facilities plan as part of the building committee's charge from the school committee. And as you know, we've been deeply involved, the building committee, our architects, and OPM in submitting a stage one uh, um, plan to the Rhode Island Department of Ed, and hopefully a stage two by February with right approval by May, 20, uh, May 22, and hopefully a referendum in June 2022, um, November 22. Moving on to technology. Uh, planning uh, and support to maintain our one-on-one -on -one device programs on a continuous basis to keep the devices current, secure, and in good working condition. Now more than ever with distance and remote learning, we realized how valuable the one-on-one -on -one devices are. We want to keep costs manageable and predictable. Our new IT director emphasizes that constantly with us. We need to implement a district-wide networking infrastructure replacement plan, and we need to provide unique educational experiences for our students by upgrading computer labs and classroom technology. When you take a look at our next slide, again, by law, we need to uh, provide you with our anticipated expenses, and I know our um, chair in her letter to you uh, talked about a 4% request. Um, that's what we would more than likely be coming in. We have, you know, we've started the budget process. We need to uh, hone in on the budget process, but um, these are our anticipated revenues uh, for this year and FY23. And of course, the actuals from the other years. Next slide. So mandated ch uh, changes. Again, we talk about mandates, mandates, mandates from the Department of Education and very little funding that goes with, uh, with those mandates. The same holds true. Uh, we are required, uh, RIDE has 
through regulation and statute has requ required cur new curriculum uh, implementation for English language arts in grades kindergarten through five and a new curriculum, English language arts curriculum in grades six through 12. Our assistant superintendent did write a, a literacy grant, so the time, effort, and the, um, the materials for the implementation of kindergarten through five uh, English language arts uh, has been paid for with a literacy grant as has been a uh, reading teacher. So again, English language arts, kindergarten through five, we've been through the exploration process, the teach teachers chose a curriculum, this is the implementation year. Currently, grades six through 12 are exploring an English language arts curriculum, and they will make a selection at the end of this year for implementation next year. At the same time, the uh, Department of Education has asked, uh, uh, has given us a requirement for ma mathematics in grades kindergarten through five. We will be entering the exploration stage uh, for those curriculum materials with the implementation uh, a year out from now. So those are, you know, major changes that really are not dollars attached to it, except for competitive grant that we did win in term, uh, did achieve in ling English language arts. Certainly if there's a math one, we will apply for that. We apply for every grants that really align with our strategic plan and the mission and vision of our school department. Uh, the ride regulations and statutes and General Assembly has given the school principal's role uh, a, a greater role in the hiring of staff, in the facilities of staff, in the budget, and school improvement teams. Ride also has enforced regulatory changes for our English language learners. Our numbers have increased over the years, and we need to add additional staff. We need to maintain our high school certified career tech uh, pathways in engineering, robotics, uh, and computer science, and the expansion of a biomedical science program. We are in our second year of the biomedical. Uh, we also got a half a million dollar Department of Defense grant for the de uh, biomedical uh, program, so that helps offset. Um, some of the cost. Hanging out there is the potential of a pre-K program. We know that there is action up in the General Assembly. We don't know how that will roll out for us with a preschool program, but we need to be ready for that. Continuation and expansion of the Beyond the Bell program. Um, we've had lots of conversation uh, about this with our council members, our town administrator, uh, to include our adult education and adult uh, transitions. And if you choose to support some of the Beyond the Bell programs that are very robust, um, that would also be beneficial to our students. We have a great resource with our planetarium. Obviously, given COVID, we haven't been able to utilize that and use it as a community re resource, but really that is uh, a, a, a a gold mine for us in terms of the potential that we could really uh, have with uh, the planetarium. And then continue to work on the proposed school bond to improve our facilities, our safety, security, and the educational program, educational enhancements. School committee sets priorities each year and goals. Again, it's our strategic uh, plan goals. It's our K-12 curriculum, both uh, English language arts, math, and I, I was remiss, I didn't mention the science. The science curriculum is, is uh, on the list for the State Department. So we, we will be dealing with a K to 12 science program. Also that has been highlighted, uh, we've always known we needed support for our social emotional learning needs, given COVID and all uh, that we have our families and our students and each other have been going through the social emotional needs are heightened for our uh, school population. Uh, professional development is key. 
uh, for our uh, for us for as continuous learners. We have new uh, English language art cur arts curriculum. It's not here's your books and go find out how to how to teach those and how to use those effectively. We have ongoing professional development for our certified and non staff. Safety, security, and health, number one priority, uh, and our facilities plan. Next, um, these are really challenges I think that both the town and school faces. Sean, you want to take it from here? Or? I think in the past we've had a number of different challenges and risk identified, uh, but as Mark and I sat down today, we sort of boiled it down into these four because uh, that's where we're spending our time. Um, COVID, uh, we, we have current issues because of COVID that are ongoing. Uh, hopefully this is peak week as everybody has promised uh, on the science side, uh, but that is certainly causing us economic uh, issues for both the town and school. Um, and also just from an operational standpoint, challenges for, for all of the town departments to continue to deliver services. Uh, on the flip side, uh, challenges within the community is, is, is our um, other sort of uh, responsibility as far as uh, providing resources for the community so they can succeed, uh, but it's also a challenging environment for them to, to operate. Uh, COVID recovery is the, the other major issue. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the ARPA money, the ESSER money, uh, the, the grant money that comes from Washington, D.C. Uh, but there's, um, it just seems like an endless list of issues that um, are very real for the people that bring them forward and for the people that care. Um, and trying to figure out, uh, and there's a lot of, we're very fortunate in our community, there are a lot of caring people. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of discussion about trying not to overlap response or uh, care that's being provided by the different people that we have uh, on Aquinnick Island and within the state. So um, a lot of work that needs to happen there. Uh, the economy is, is a, a real challenge. I don't think anyone has a real good grip on, on the economy right now. If they did, um, they would be famous. Uh, but we have everything from supply chain issues, labor issues, uh, inflation, interest rates, um, and these are all things that, you know, in different budgets haven't been of concern. Um, they're, they're concerned, but not as concerning as they are right now. Um, and the issues that we're, we're sort of reading about have a very real impact on the decisions that we're making, uh, including the discussion this uh, later in the meeting about borrowing uh, related to the school buildings uh, because it relates to the cost of the project as well as the cost of, of repayments of debt um, as well as the ability to afford debt. So uh, really a lot of big issues um, that, that impact the town as well as everybody home. And then the final issue is, the, is getting the school budget back into balance. Um, we had some, some revenues, some non-tax non revenues um, that cause, that, that will be a, an issue in the current year. I talked about the non-recurring use of fund balance. Um, we're looking at expenditure issues um, that may or may not have caused uh, structural issues within the school department budget. Uh, but the bottom line is that we need to address those and have a plan for going forward uh, so that the school department can focus on providing services to the community um, and that we can uh, adequately resource them, not only in the upcoming fiscal year, but also future fiscal years. I just want to go to the next slide. Um, I think in past years, I've always listed negotiations as a challenge. And when I spoke to Mark this morning, I think, and I, I, I will echo this, I think, for everybody in the room, is that our employees have really pitched in, um, really in a, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, but in an extraordinary, terrific way. Um, they are the heroes of the town, whether they're in a classroom, in a police car, or a fire truck, or the public works truck, and 
and every other department um, here at Town Hall, uh, the library, the senior center. Uh, so I don't, I, I purposely didn't list negotiations as a challenge, uh, but I still include these negotiation dates uh, within the presentation just to make you aware that um, we do have these, these collective bargaining agreements that we'll have to uh, talk about with our employees, uh, some of them in the upcoming year, and um, those will have to be managed within the context of the budget and everything that's happening within the community. I'm going to just give it to Mark to talk a little bit about the next steps since he's sort of the guy who drives the, the train here. Thank you, Sean. Next slide, please. So the next steps are all dates. So on March 23rd, the school committee submits the proposed budget to the town administrator. On Friday, April 1st, the town administrator submits the proposed consolidated budget to town council via the town clerk. The next two dates are proposed dates, Wednesday, March 18th, I mean May 18th, the first public hearing on proposed budget May 25th is the second public hearing on the budget ordinance adoption. Just want to point out, I'd like to thank Elaine Colarusa for putting the presentation together. But more importantly, uh, this evening we did hand out the revenue conference manual. Um, that's also available online to all of the town's residents. And I think we typically put a copy over at the library and um, I think we, the clerk's office. Just a couple items I'll point out on page seven. Uh, the town council wanted more information about uh, when revenues were reviewed, who approves the different uh, revenue structures throughout the budget. So on page seven, Elaine has included a table uh, that indicates who's responsible for the rate setting. So you can see, uh, say, for um, the concession stand at the concession revenue, you can see that that's a revenue that's authorized and managed by the town council. Uh, whereas uh, I'll use uh, vital statistics, uh, a fee that you would pay at the clerk's office is actually a revenue set by the state of Rhode Island. Uh, so Elaine has updated that. And then as you go through the different categories, uh, what we said is that we would add an additional field. Uh, Elaine has gone through and we've started that process. There's a, a field called rate revisions. Um, and like a lot of documents that we have, um, we've started to go through and update those to say when uh, rates were last updated. And as we continue to work with this document year after year, that will become a more populated field with more current information, which is what we discussed uh, a couple months back. Uh, but this, this is an important document. It, it does include all of our revenues. It identifies where the authorization for those revenues comes from. And uh, not only does it provide a historical look at that, but it also provides a forecast for fiscal year 23 and 24. Um, so with that, I do want to just ask Rosemary, there's some additional slides. I'm not sure if she wants to cover anything in those. Um, I do want to thank her and the school department for uh, working with us to get both the manual and the presentation done tonight. And uh, I think that's it. So I'll just let her talk about her supplemental. We just mission. really provided some uh, supplemental material to put context to what we were talking about in terms of the curriculum, the timelines from the Department of Education, uh, what the, our budget uh, addresses. So I don't have to go through those. We can do those at a, another time. But what the ESSER dollars, what high quality uh, curriculum materials mean and uh, the timeline for each of those. So we appreciate that we were able to uh, put those into the town school revenue conference, but again, it just provides context for the uh, areas that we talked about. Thank you. And it was, it's, you know, again, working with Sean and Mark and our finance department getting this done is uh, a good, good efforts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, looking forward to the budget because it's not going to be an easy one, but. Uh, uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together. Okay. Okay. 
So let's move. Any, anybody have any questions? Any comments? No? Okay. Nate, am I too close or am I I'm okay? Okay. Okay, let's move on to number three, communication of myself, uh, Middletown Town Council, and to reference to information in accordance with Rhode Island General Law 16-2-21. Motion received said communication. Second. We have a motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. And, and this is basically um, just a letter I have to send to the Town Council President sends to, uh, it's a formality, to the uh, tree chair, chairperson of the school committee. Um, just basically saying what the max is you can ask for by statute. So, um, and Sean had covered all that. So, are there any questions on this? Okay. Let's move on to number four memorandum of Teresa Spangler and reference uh, school committee chair in reference to pre budget consultation, fiscal year 2022 2023. Motion received, said memorandum. Second. We have a motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And it's basically Teresa does the same thing. She has to send a letter to the town saying that, um, um, you know, on, on with, uh, in accordance with Rhode Island General Law 16-2121 um, of the school district, preparation of the school district's 2023 budget. Okay. Is there any questions? Any comments? No? Okay. Let's move on to the public forum. Pursuant to Rule 25 of the Rules of the Council, uh, citizens may address the town on one subject only, said subject of substantial town business, neither discussed in the meeting nor related to personnel or performance. Citizens may speak for no longer than five minutes and must submit a public participation form to the council clerk. Prior to the start of the meeting, all items discussed during the session will not be voted upon. And we do have one, uh, Antone Viveris. Antoine Viveris, 1, Admiralty Drive, Middletown, Rhode Island, Department 11. Uh, it's a Bimmer Road and Navy property study. The Equipment Island Planning Commission, a private organization, held a summit on May 13, 2019, to discuss economic development on Aquinnick Island's west side. Several residents asked to attend but were not allowed. The discussion was exclusively about reuse of Burma Road and the excess Navy property, including the toxic tank farms property, possibly for a, a what I heard was a mini Quonset uh, point. In attendance were two members of the General Assembly, two members of both Middletown and Portsmouth councils, two employees of Portsmouth and Newport, a representative from Wright Dock, the uh, Rhode Island Commerce Commit uh, Corporation, the Navy Community Liaison, and Senator White House's office. I have the link. I'll have to give you the information as soon as I'm done. Uh, shortly after that meeting, October 2019, without public discussion or council approval, Mr. Mr. Brown, Middletown Administrator, Richard Reiner, Portsmouth Administrator, and Joe Nicholson, Newport, uh, City Council requested a $300,000 grant from the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank, citing economic development on the west side. The grant for the Aquinnick Island Infrastructure Study was approved on October 19, 2019. In May 2020, Com Com Congressman Cicilline announced a $300,000 matching grant from the Economic Development Administration. Per Engineering, PA Engineering, was awarded the Aquitnick Island Infrastructure Study contract on September 21, 2020. The final report was published in May 2021. Except for Congressman Cicilline's announcement, the public has been completely unaware of the pursuit for the state to take responsibility and possession of Burma Road for economic development. Why did our administrators request uh, grant funding without council approval? Uh, why weren't our town economic development committee involved in such critical economic decision like that? What are the actual development plans and how do they fit with each community's comprehensive plan? Why weren't residents informed regarding major economic development plans 
on Bremer Road and the Navy Tank Farm property. In 2005, the Aquinnick Island Planning Commission published a West Side Master Plan. The plan envisioned a vibrant West Side with a mix of com commercial, residential, and recreation development of surplus Navy property and an ex extension of Burma Road. The plan left the tank farm areas undeveloped for a proposed sewer treatment plant if the state of Rhode Island forced Portsmouth to install sewer sewers because the Newport plant could not handle the increased flow. So many questions, not enough answers. Do residents support a mini quantum point on the west side? What about the Rhode Island uh, Department of Transportation? Were they part? <clears throat> Were they part of the discussions? Did Peter Avedi uh, want to spend his resources accepting responsibility for unknown toxins and an underground fuel pipe running the length of Burma Road? Too many questions. I think the people need answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Viveris. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, move on. Acting as a Board of License Commission number six. Uh, I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Motion to act as a Board of License Commission. Second. Motion to second to act as a Board of License Commission. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Acting as a Board of License Commission, number six, public hearings have been advertised. Abutters have been notified. Um, application of Mikano Pizza, LLC, DBA, Mikano Pizza, Pub, 59 Aquinnick Avenue for a Class BV liquor license for the 2021-2022 licensing year. Uh, to be used at the same premises, and this is for the first floor only, and this is new. Motion to grant said license. Second. We have a motion to second to grant said license. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Motion to reconvene as town council. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mo uh, let's move on to the consent calendar. Motion to approve the consent calendar as written. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the consent calendar. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's uh, move back on to licenses and permits. In the application of Mikano Pizza, LLC, DBA, Mikano Pizza Pub, 59 Aquinnick Avenue, for a Victor House license for the 2021 2022 licensing year. This is new. Motion to grant said license contingent upon building official, fire marshal, and board of health approvals. Second. A motion is second to approve. Is there any discussion? Best of luck to you, Nick. I think you'll, I think you'll do great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Anybody opposed? Let's move on to number 11, application of South Coast Subs of Rhode Island Incorporated, DBA Jersey Mike Subs. Well, about time, right? Yes. <laughs> 7 East Main Road, Unit C, for a Vitching House license for the 2021-2022 licensing year. This is new. Motion to grant said license contingent upon building official, fire marshal, and board of health approvals. Second. Motion to second to approve. Any, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, other communications. Number 12, review of the town's bond issue plan and debt capacity. Motion begin said review of the town's bond issue plan and debt capacity. Second. Motion is second to uh, receive, to review rather. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion regarding the school building committee and bond issue. So in order for you to have the information that you need to make a decision regarding the bond issues, the towns reach out to their financial advisors, Hilltop Securities, to provide uh, this plan issue document, bond issue plan and debt capacity analysis. We have two representatives from Hilltop tonight, Maureen Gahesian and Matt Blaze, who will present shortly this debt study and bond issue plan. I'd just like to give you a little information of what Hilltop does for the town. They are very instrumental with Maureen and Matt um, with all our bond issues. They also are always looking out for ways that the town can save money through bond refinancing. 
They also prepare the debt section in the budget book. They also help us file our annual compliance requirements on all of our open bond issues. And they also prepare special projects, just like this one. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Maureen and Matt. OK. Welcome. Can you hear us, Matt? You have to unmute. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you would think I'd be better at this now. You would think. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Can it, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone, uh, council president, members of the council. I uh, just want to start off by thanking you all for your time this evening and thanking the town administrator and finance director, Sean and Mark, for the invitation to speak with you all uh, to review the town's debt options um, and for bonding for future projects and the impact that they may, that, that may have on the town. Uh, we provide a presentation to guide our conversation. Um, I'm going to refer to that throughout, throughout my speech over here. And without further ado, uh, I'll get us started. Um, so, uh, Mark, does everyone have the presentation in front of them? We do. Okay, great. Um, so I will start off on slide one. So we start off in this first slide by outlining the town's existing debt position. Um, the town is currently rated AA1 by Moody's Investor Service. Uh, that's one notch below the highest rating of AAA. The rating agencies complete a periodic review of the town either every two years through a rating agency surveillance, um, or they perform a review when the town issues bonds, such as when the town issued the refunding bonds in June, 2021. Hey, uh, Matt, she, Matt, excuse me. Can you just hang on one second? The slides aren't catching up with you. Oh, of course. Okay, now they are. No problem. Okay, go ahead. There you go. Sorry. Nope, nope, no problem at all. Um, so as I was just saying, um, they're either, they're either reviewing the town every two years through their rating agency surveillance, or they're performing a review um, when the town issues the bonds, like in June 2021, there were the refunding bonds that achieved a debt service payment. So historically, uh, Moody's has viewed the town's debt favorably with relatively low debt levels that are supported by taxpayers, um, and debt that pays off quickly with approximately 70% amortizing over 10 years, um, this is mentioned in the rating report as they note a very manageable debt burden and a strong bond structure. Uh, the table on this page, it looks forward to the next fiscal year. So starting in 2022, um, and it shows the general obligation debt of the town, or that's the town, that's the uh, debt, excuse me, that is supported by taxpayers. So the business activities debt that's also shown there. Um, that was borrowed through the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank, just for some background and clarification. Um, it's borrowed at below market rates for sewer projects, and all sewer bonds um, through RIB that were issued after 2005, um, those are supported by user fees. Everything prior to that is still a general obligation supported by taxpayers. Um, so for fiscal year 2022, if no bonds are issued prior to that, the outstanding principal amount of the debt will be $26.1 million. Um, and debt service, the principal and interest payment, that's going to equal $4.1 million. And both of those, as you can see, they decline as the bonds are paid off. Um, so I'm going to move over to slide two and just let... Okay, perfect. I see that one has come up. So... Outside of the contemplated larger school bond issuance um, that we're going to get to shortly, the town has other issuance plans to preserve open space, um, construction of a new library, uh, improvements to the school maintenance building. And we've assumed the open space and the new library bonds could be issued together uh, to save on the issuance costs, as opposed to having two separate bond issues. Um, the total need for those two projects equals 18 million. Uh, it's reflected in that project fund deposit line item. And because the current interest rate environment is so low, uh, as with past issuances of the town, they're not going to need to issue the full $18 million to receive that same amount for projects. Um, the total estimated principal and interest payments, assuming a 20-year final maturity for both of the projects combined, uh, would be around $23.15 million. And the projected annual debt service 
would be 1.1 million. Uh, these numbers include a buffer uh, to account for potential increases in rates, um, just to give us a little a little wiggle room and account for any uh, movement in the market, um, as we've been seeing lately. Uh, moving on to slide three. So th this next page just shows the annual debt service for each project. So you can see uh, the open space and library bonds, they match up to right around that 1.1 million in debt service per year. Um, the 1 million for the school maintenance building, it's currently shown as gross debt service um, as what would be owed. But if it is issued through the Rhode Island Health and Educational Building Corporation, it may be eligible for a, for, for a minimum 35% reimbursement on that principal and interest cost. So these payments could potentially be less. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the next slide, slide four. Great, thank you. Um, so this next slide, it addresses the school bonding options. The, the town provided us several bonding options for potential school bonds that could address different designs and project sign sizes. Uh, it ranges from approximately 90 million on the lower end, and it goes up to 184.5 million as the maximum size. Uh, the table below, it provides an overview of those options and what each would include a, as a scope. Um, so the blue columns show the total principal that would be issued. So, so the total size of the bond um, to achieve the desired project fund size. The yellow orange, uh, or depending on how it shows up on, on your computer or printout, uh, that shows the, the net issuance and debt service amount. So by issuing through that Rhode Island Health and Educational Building Corporation, the town could realize that minimum 35% housing aid reimbursement on the debt service um, provided by the Rhode Island Department of Education program for qualified school projects. And these would be, the, the, we are assuming that these are qualified school projects. Um, and they could also be eligible for a potential five to 15% reimbursement based on new incentives uh, that vary by project in eligibility. So, and, and that could be anything as in uh, health and safety, or it could be uh, their newer and fewer program consolidation. Um, there are a few different notches that, that, that the state has incentivized. Um, so you can see that the reimbursement has a significant impact on the debt burden, and it's going to play a major role in the affordability of these bonds. Um, can, can we move on to slide five, please? Okay. So uh, on this page, we assume that the bonds could be issued as early as spring 2023, um, and the assumptions assume rates as of January 10th right now, uh, with an additional one ba 100 basis points or 1% uh, added to rates to account for any market movement on the upside. So we're trying to take a very conservative approach to this. Um, as we mentioned, uh, the analysis assumes the minimum 35% reimbursement. Uh, it has the potential for five to 15% in the bonus points that, uh, varying by project. Um, the average 20 year borrowing rate through all of the scenarios is 3%. Uh, the blue highlighted portions are where I'd like to bring your focus. Uh, they outline the project fund deposit for each scenario. The gross interest and in debt service before reimbursement uh, is also shown in that second blue column. Um, and then also uh, there's the net cost after factoring in the reimbursement and the bonus points. So to take the 90 million project scenario as an example, uh, the town would need to borrow 82.5 million which without a reimbursement or bonus would cost 121 million in principal and interest, estimated 121 million in principal and interest. Um, but you would only need to repay 66.8 million in net debt service after factoring in that minimum 35% reimbursement for the housing aid and those bonus incentives. Um, and so this can be view viewed throughout the other scenarios as well. Um, it just to pick another, the 130 million project scenario would require the 119.6 million issuance uh, for total debt service of 176 million. Uh, but with the reimbursement and incentives, the only the uh, or the incentives only cost, excuse me, 
Um, those are those are estimated at 96.8 million uh, for the total debt service. Um, so I'm gonna, if there's no questions there, I'm going to move on to slide six, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, of course, too. Um, so similar to the open space library school maintenance slide, this slide shows the annual debt service payments under each option. Uh, so to reference the option D and option E I mentioned in the previous slide um, for the 90 million and the 130 million scenarios, for the 130.6 million project size, the average annual net debt service is 4.8 million. And for the 90 million project, it's 3.3 million. And we can move on to the next slide. So before jumping in capacity analysis, we have this slide to address our approach. Um, we're, we're ultimately building off of what the town already completes on a yearly basis when reviewing their debt capacity and how it fits with their future borrowing plans. So um, these recommended debt limits, they're derived from the Rhode Island Public Public Finance Management Board's local government debt affordability study, um, which is directed at local cities and towns in Rhode Island. Um, and it also, in addition, uh, it also takes into account rating agency medians and expectations. Uh, so if the open space and library bonds are being issued uh, during the summer of this year, summer of 2022, uh, the capacity analysis goes on to show how much remaining capacity is available for schools beginning in the summer of 2023. Um, what we've provided in the following slides is a base case for where we see the, the optimal borrowing scenarios under uh, uh, borrowing scenario under the provided options. Um, and then also a stressed case to show how much the town can borrow before ratios begin to exceed the recommended limits. Um, so if we can move on to slide eight. So the base case uh, assumes option E for the 90.05 million in total school project. Um, and also, that also assumes that the open space, the library and the school maintenance building are also being funded as well. So all of the debt issuance, all the debt issuances and debt service assume the net amounts after reimbursement and bonus. Um, you can see under the projected additional net debt column, that first column after the date, um, the total additional debt line is 62.225 million. The amount to be repaid in principal, it, it, that's the 62.225 million, but, but it's after the reimbursement and, the, and, those, um, and those bonus incentive points. The total amount that would actually be the burden of the town, it would show up on the audit, it would show up on the other paperwork, is the 99.355 million. I just want, and that, and that means that's the school building option E, open space, uh, school maintenance building library. And I just want to clarify that because the, the, reimburse, the reimbursement will not be paid until after the issuance of the bonds. Um, so it's just an important uh, thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, and so here we have the, these ratios. I'll give a little background on the ratios just so we know what we're actually looking at here. Um, the, the net direct debt to full value, this is a ratio that compares the town's debt that is budgeted with taxpayer funds to the assessed property value. Um, two of the rating agencies, Moody's and S&P, use the 3% as, as a benchmark in their methodologies. It's also used in the PFMB report. So we use that for the town's metrics as well. Um, the overall debt plus the net pension liability plus the, the, um, the OPEB, the other post-employment benefit liability to full value. This is shown for us to consider the total liability burden of the town. So it includes all debt, pension, and those OPEB liabilities relative to the underlying town uh, population's ability to pay. So uh, the, that leaves us with the last one here, the governmental debt service, plus pension actuarially determined contribution, the ADC, plus the OPEP payment to the governmental expenditures. 
So this ratio compares the annual cost of liabilities to the annual municipal budget. So this is really portrayed as a carrying cost metric. Um, and it's also utilized by the rating agencies in addition to the Rhode Island PFMG. So um, all of that is, 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 a, is the description of the ratios. And, and really what it's saying is that none of these ratios are in excess of the limit for this scenario. Um, it, it's the base case, it's the lowest borrowing option, and it's also the most affordable option uh, being the lowest cost. Can we, uh, can we pivot over to slide nine? Great, thank you. Um, so this is the stressed scenario. Uh, the total additional debt for this scenario equals 136.55 million uh, for the school funding option D, open space, the new library and school maintenance building. Um, that results in net additional debt after the reimbursement and bonus of 82.3 million. Uh, we've labeled this a stress case as one of the ratios slightly exceeds the limit. Um, an important point I'd like to make is in fiscal year 2021, pension systems had a particularly strong performance. Uh, so it is possible that the latest pension numbers from 2021 will be favorable compared to what's shown in this analysis. But with that said, uh, the net direct debt to full value is teetering on the limit of 3%, right at 2.985% after the issuance of the school bonds in fiscal year 2023. Uh, so if this option is pursued, the future capacity will be limited um, as the town may have to hold off on issuing bonds in the foreseeable future until the ratios decrease the levels that do not stress the recommended limit. And uh, if we could just move to slide 10, please. Great, thank you. Well, that takes us to our, our last slide here. Uh, it's addressing the rating agency considerations. And uh, this, is, this is a large undertaking by the town and the rating agencies are gonna want you all to demonstrate the importance of the projects and to confirm that the borrowing's not gonna interrupt operations or the ability to service the existing and projected debt. Um, so it's gonna be important to have a preemptive discussion with Moody's to discuss the financing and its potential impact uh, once the bond sizing option is selected. Um, now, Moody's specifically identifies a material <clears throat> increase to the town's outstanding debt as a key factor that could lead to a downgrade. Um, when Moody's prepares their rating, it, it includes quantitative and qualitative factors before arriving at the outcome um, or what they refer to as their, as their scorecard. And so the debt and pension uh, piece of that, that accounts for 20% of the scorecard. And currently between the, the four different metrics that they're looking at, it's between a, a double A and an A category, which is below the current double A one rating at the town has. Um, now, when looking at the scorecard as a whole, Quantitatively, the town really only achieves a double A2 rating, but with additional qualitative notching, such as the presence of the Naval Station, which they see as a positive, that brings the rating up to a double A1 level. So this potential large bond issue, uh, what we're gonna wanna mitigate is that bringing those, quality, or those quantitative factors, excuse me, down to a you know double A three or level or lower double A two level, um, and really having the whole outcome as a, as a, as a downgrade uh, to double A two. Um, now that's the downside scenario with the rating agencies. It would be you know one notch. They'd probably be looking at maybe perhaps a one notch downgrade, um, and it would be a double A two. And what we would see for a potential pricing spread between those two ratings, um, it's approximately 0.04% or so. Um, it, it's, it's, it's relatively low right now, um, that's four basis points. But you know, in the grand scheme, it, it could be 400, it could be $4,500 uh, per million dollars borrowed. So if it's a hundred million dollars borrowed, that could be an additional four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in interest. Um, 
So that is where that is where we came up in the analysis, and uh, I, I know I, I went through those slides uh, quite quickly in the interest of time. Um, so I just want to circle back with the council members and, and see if there are any questions I can address or any other um, anything else I can help with. Happy happy to answer any questions. Okay, Matt. Thank you. Does any councils have any questions for Matt? Looks like you're getting it off the hook easy tonight, Matt. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, no, we no, thank if you. There, if there's any follow-up, please, I, I, I'm available. Um, it's Sean and Mark know, and I, I'd be happy for any follow-up if anything comes up uh, uh, in your thoughts over the night. <clears throat> we do have somebody. Terry has a question. Okay, so one of our counselors who is um, um, uh, via Zoom has a question, Matt, okay? Yes, oh, definitely. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. And... Um, Sorry for the confusion with Zoom. I am getting unmuted. Um, nice to see you, Matt. Thanks for coming coming on. And uh, I am not a numbers person, but I just wanted to <laughs> clarify a couple of things. I noticed on slide four that the assumptions made with that would be all of the reimbursements would be achieved not just the one that we, I think, are guaranteed at the 35% one, but all of the other ones as well. Is that true? Um, it, is, it is assuming, yes, that is correct. It is assuming that the minimum 35% reimbursement is achieved. Uh, there have been some um, projections on where those five to 15% bonus points could shake out. Uh, based on the projects that are going to be financed and their potential eligibility for those bonus points. But um, yes, right now it does also include the bonus points and what's expected to be received by those. Okay, so it's, it's sort of that, that slide four is, a, is sort of a best case scenario. Is that true? I would assume, yes. I, I would say, well, I would say that it is a realistic scenario based on what's been laid out so far. Um, it, it, would, it would be one of the better cases because you are receiving those bonus points, but there is also the possibility that more bonus points could be received. So I'd like to think of it more as a middle of the road option than it is a, an absolute best, best case. Um, but there's a plus or minus on either side that could, that could be, con you know, probable if, if you were looking is, at it statistically. Yes, that is correct. That okay. is correct. Okay, thank you. I want to move to slide eight, um, where we're the highlight percentage. Let me get that right because you spoke really fast, also. That is the annual cost of liabilities to the annual budget. Did I get that wrong? Um, or is it slide, oh, I'm slide sorry, nine? I'm slide eight, and I'm in the furthest right hand corner. The all I'm, I'm calling it the all in count column if if I got that right from what you said. Right. So, yeah, the, the governmental debt service, uh, pension ADC plus OPEB requirement to governmental expenditures. That's everything, everything expenditure. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> everything liability. Exactly. Yeah, and that's the one that, right, right. That's the one that compares the annual cost of liabilities to the total annual municipal budget. Okay. Um, yes. So 22.66, that's what it would be if all of these projects got approved and went to bond. Correct. So my question, I see that puts us close to the higher end of, of the liability portfolio of the, of, you know, in those I think, I guess that's my question, is where does that stand in a comparison of other municipalities? Um, other municipal, I would say, you know, you know we're, we're, the, the, a lot of the municipalities in Rhode Island, um, they do have some significant um, pension and OPEB liabilities. So I would say that, that that column tends to be more stressed than the first two. Um, but but as far as 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 far as like where Middletown would compare, I mean they would compare probably favorably compared to some others. But I think that it would be consistent still, you know, with a lot of other municipalities in Rhode Island that kind of teeter on that higher end, um, but still manageable under the twenty two point five percent as far as the recommended limit. 
And, and you made the, first of all, I want to say our, my, uh, in my package, my hard copy docket package, I, I have a different page nine. I don't have that stressed um, page. So I, I'm not sure where that went. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Uh, but okay. my last question is that uh, when you said that the town may not be able to go to bond for, you know, if this all went forward, it may be difficult to go to bond again in the short term or moderate term future, understood. So I guess my question is, do you feel like we, the town would be over committing its tax paying citizens to consider this full package? Mm -hmm. You know, it would, I would say it would be worth a further discussion with the rating agencies before committing to an answer to that. And the only reason why I would say is because, you know, I would say, I would say it's not that you can't go out and bond extra, uh, for, for, for more future projects, even if you did the 130. I mean, it not you could, but it would it would be at the detriment of, of, of the taxpayers, I would say, because you would likely get um, hit by the rating agencies with a lower rating, and therefore your borrowing costs would increase. Um, th that would be my conservative answer. I mean, I would like to say, you know, I, I, would, I would like to say, it, 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 I think it's a balance of the needs um, you know, the balance of the project needs, obviously, uh, 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 quite a few options were laid out for the town as well. And I think, you know, considering the more or less lowest option that still achieves the town's plan um, is still prudent in that case and, and obviously could be refined a little bit further. Um, but I, I would say, you know, if you're still within the parameters and if the future debt plans are are strategically laid out where you can still remain within these metrics, um, and, and we have, and we evaluate that with future borrowings as we do. Like I said, with the capacity analysis every year, if this was to be bonded out, you know, we would look. Okay, it, it, do you have anything in the future that would potentially pop up? Because here is how we would have to layer it in, and now we're going to have to see where we can fit it in the future. And it all depends on what comes in for the sizing of this bond issue. I know that was kind of a long-winded answer. That's okay. I just yeah. have one question that it may or may not be your ballywick, but um, I'm concerned about interest rates going up. I mean, if they go up for consumers, don't do they go up for municipalities or these types of instruments? You know, and what's the the I guess conversation or water bubbler? Uh, you know. Um, discussion about when and how much and you know what are people looking at that have your expertise and in your industry right as far as far as overall market sentiment yeah yes we are in we've been experiencing a rising interest rate environment um since just prior to the beginning of the year due to some inflationary pressures um it's it's somewhat normalized but i would say yes it, it's still tracking the market and, and rates could potentially go up over the short term that as far as what the Fed is expecting um, for rate increases, they are expecting, you know, short term rate increases, which are going to resonate throughout the market. Um, you know, with that said, we did, that's why we did build in some additional cushion here. So essentially, right, so essentially, you know, the market could, could experience a 100 basis point, a 1% increase to total rates. Um, through our projected closing date on here through, you know, summer of 2023. Um, and we would still be at the same levels that we're looking at here in this analysis. Now, if they started ticking up even further than that, it would be, that would be a pretty significant increase over that time period. And we would have to reevaluate just to make sure that none of these levels were stressed, or we would have to go back to perhaps the drawing board with the options. To see what could fit. Okay, right. thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. You're welcome. Okay, does anybody have any further questions of Matt? Matt, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you very much, it. Council President, members thank of the Council. You. Thank you for it. your uh, for your uh, input Take and care. your work.
Okay. Um, yeah, we got to. Uh, we made a little error on an, on an earlier um, item, so we need to we need to take a step back to it's the public car. hearing right. for um, the, the licenses. So we need to motion to act as a board of licenses. Second. Motion to second to act as board of licenses. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to reconsider. Second. We have a motion to second to reconsider. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So this is number six, right? Yes. Yeah. So. You have to read it again? Yeah, I'm going to read it in again. Um, we had a, a advertised a public hearing, and um, I didn't open it up. So that's what Wendy was talking to me about. So we need to fix that. So I apologize. So number six, public hearing has been advertised. Bud has been notified. Application of Mikano Pizza, LLC, DBA, Mikano Pizza, Pub, 59 Aquinic Ave for a Class BV liquor license for the 2021 2022 licensing year to be used at the same premises for the first floor only. This is new. Motion to open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there anyone that would like to speak on um, the advertised license for Mikano Pizza Pub, 59 Aquinic Avenue? Okay. Motion. Anybody, anybody on? Public hearing. There's no one online. No online, okay. So Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to grant said license. Second. Uh, motion to second to grant said license. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. I apologize for that. Motion to reconvene as town council. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Wendy, thank you. Okay, let's move on to number um, 13. Uh, school building committee proposals, conceptual design, cost <laughs> estimates, fiscal impact analysis, levied real uh, property tax as of 1 7 2022. Motion to receive said fiscal impact analysis, levied real estate property tax as of 1 7 Second. Motion and second to receive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sean or Mark, do you guys want to talk on this? Have this to present, or I think we have this a slide on this. Can we put that slide up, please. It's a little hard to see on on the screen. Uh, this is a schedule that was provided at the last council meeting, and it's a fiscal impact analysis. Uh, what we've done is. The assessor has taken the uh, tax roll that was certified uh, for this fiscal year, and what we've done is taken the, the debt estimates that were prepared originally by Mark uh, and then by Matt, who just made the presentation, Hilltop Securities, and what we did is we figured out with each of the options uh, that the school building committee has presented uh, what would be the incremental cost to a taxpayer based on the value of their house? Uh, so actually you can see it clearer now uh, At the top of the screen you can see the current tax rate uh, residential 1202 commercial property 1723 and then in the next section uh, You can see the five different options that have been presented by the committee the gross forecasted cost of each of those the net forecasted option and what that represents is the estimated reimbursement that we would get from ride uh, and then finally on the fourth line what the estimated debt service payment would be that number changed a little bit uh, when mark did it we did it based on information we had and used more or less a straight uh, calculation of the, what the debt service was uh, when Hilltop looked at it, and the numbers that are here match the amortization schedules that are in the presentation they just made, uh, they considered the premiums that could be achieved uh, with a borrowing, uh, as well as changes that they actually see in the market from year to year. Uh, so uh, these are, are more accurate illustrations of what we would expect to see for uh, debt service payments. Uh, so just, we've been talking about option E, 
that project has a gross forecasted option cost of $90,050,301. After reimbursements, the estimate uh, estimated cost is to the town is $49,312,317. So we're, there's a forecasted reimbursement rate of 45%, percent which means that for the project we're essentially paying 55 cents on each dollar of the project the forecasted annual debt service payment for the town would be three million three hundred and thirty nine thousand six hundred and thirty five dollars and what that would do to the tax rate and I'll just stay with option E and you'll see that in that first orange line the residential tax rate would go from twelve dollars and two cents per thousand dollars assessed to twelve dollars and ninety cents. Um, if if we can scroll down a little bit, the way I've constructed this table, and we can put this online for for people. Um, if you go across, and I'll just use uh, so houses in Middletown generally, I'll use that go to three hundred thousand uh, dollars because that's where we start to see a lot of Middletown residents uh, or property owners. If you use option E, someone with that house valued at $300,000 would see their taxes increase by approximately $264. Um, if you looked at the $400,000 $400, valuation, it would go up $352. And that's how this, this schedule works. If we scroll down to the next section yes. for commercial property, which you can see now, the commercial tax rate presently is $17.23. If we put it into the model, we would expect it to go up to $18.35. Uh, and again, if you use those different rows with the assessments, uh, and I'll just use that $500,000 mark, you would look at option E, assessment of $500,000. You would see an increase in taxes of $560 for each year. Uh, again, just to highlight, uh, again, this is based on the forecasted tax levy data for fiscal year 22 and the budget that was adopted for 22. And um, there's an estimated interest rate of the 4%, which with Hilltop is, is modified uh, to represent market conditions when it comes to the bonds, as well as repayments year to year. Uh, but again, I think that gives you a, a picture of what the person at home or the person who gets the bill in the mail uh, would see when you look at the cost of this project, moving it from that uh, net $49,312,000 to um, I'm, I'm Sean's mom and my house is valued somewhere between two and $300,000, so I'm gonna get a tax bill increase of about you know, two hundred and twenty dollars in that 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 range. So that's how you would use that table. President, Dennis, I have a question on that. Yes, um, Sean, as a percentage increase, what are we looking at? As a, it, my numbers are coming out to that would be close to a forty percent increase in taxes. Seven percent. Well, you. I take eighteen three five, uh, or take the twelve point nine minus the eight three five. So that mill rate going up. No, it's twelve point nine minus twelve oh two. The the current rate's twelve dollars and two cents, and the projected rate is twelve dollars and ninety cents. Okay, I was looking at the eighteen point three five. That's the commercial tax rate. So you'd have to compare the eighteen three five to the current tax commercial tax rate of seventeen point two three. Okay. Sorry, I was looking at that nope. wrong. Thank you. Yep. So what is the percentage? You said seven? Seven. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any other questions, Sean? No? Okay. Let's move on to uh, number 14. Communication of Charlie Roberts, co-chair on behalf of the Middletown Public Schools Building Committee. Reference to requesting town council to approve the conceptual designs and cost estimates, which will allow the committee to further their designs to keep their schedule for bond referendum and ride phase two applications. Motion to receive said communication. 
Second. I have a motion and a second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Charlie? Good evening. Um, Good evening. Just want to thank you again for the workshop on the 10th. I think uh, the school committee, building committee, and the town council really went through all our options. Um, and I think it was very successful. Since that time, we've answered a number of questions. We actually have a Q&A document we can give to you, uh, but we've also sent some of those via email as well. But we've, we've answered a number of questions that have come up, and if more come up, we're prepared tonight to answer more. I um, want to thank Sean and um, Hilltop Securities for really helping to paint the financial picture as well of these options. You know, we, we stand before you today. We, we recommended to the school committee option E with, with the uh, designs the, and with the cost estimates at this time. We, we sent that to the school committee on January 10th. They approved that as well. So now we're um, before you tonight to ask you to, you know, vote on um, in this forward so we can move into schematic design so we can move forward with option E and the cost estimates that have been prepared. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any comments, questions? Oh, I had a question, Mr. President. Or yes, ma'am. Am I on? You are. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I, I did send in some questions. Hi, Charlie. How's it going? Hi, good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And I, I just have to um, give kudos to the school building committee and, and chair Charlie Roberts in front of us with their organization plan communication and execution. I was running through the file this weekend uh, from back in May when it, it was first presented to us the mission and uh, the members and how it proceeded from there. I think you've done an amazing effort. Um, you really should write a playbook and uh, counsel other communities for how to actually get to this point. I am really impressed and you should be really pleased um, to help my town so, much, so well. Um, I just have a few questions. Some of them, I'm, I think, Sean, I can get the answers from later, but I did want a couple of things explained um, if you're able to. I think the, the process um, to kind of go back to the overview is that your great layers of communication, we got the, the list of deficiencies was done to, I mean, to a finite level, um, reviewed with professionals who know how the Rhode Island reimbursement program works. You know, you provided five options, balancing mandatory repairs with the reimbursement program, town staff got involved, obviously the, uh, um, you know, um, finance people got involved to, to look it over and then Ride will look at it and filter it and we'll, it'll come back and, you know, it'll ultimately be up to the taxpayer, I think. Um, so I think all the work and homework has really been done and done well. I did want a couple of things clarified uh, just for myself, for the public. Um, the... At one, in one of the answers to one of the questions, it said that um, if the extension, the December 1st, 22nd is, uh, extension is denied um, at the state level, then I think one of the game plan options was stated to be that it, some alternatives were incorporated into the project to act as a safety valve, both up and down. If the debt service, uh, if the extension was denied, the debt service had to go up. And I'm not exactly sure what those, what that meant, like all, uh, incorporating alternatives to act as a, sa as a safety valve, both up and down. I, I guess, does that mean, you know, if, if rates went down and we ended up with more resources, we could add things, or if the interest rates went up or the, the extension was denied, we'd have less money and things would get taken off the list to do. Um, could you explain that? Or is that something that the architect and that other group um, needs to address? Well, um, I, I definitely benefit from the team I have behind me. So I will ask um, both Ed and, and Holly if they want to answer as well. But from what I understand, what that is basically saying is we, we're going to 
take this. We have an estimate now. We're going to take this in the schematic design. We're going to know through the next several months here how much of those bonus points we're going to get, and we will make prudent decisions according to that. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on that, Holly. Is that? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So there's sort of there. So there's a plan in place if that extension is denied. I guess is my my bottom line question. Yeah, I think we're, we we'll look at that. We'll look at the adjustments um, and and plan accordingly when we go through the schematic design. We're really going to dial in now at this point our designs and our cost estimates even further. Okay, I I want I do want to clarify on the expenditure or the improvement. <laughs> that have been made to the school since they were built back in the 1950s, 60s. I, I know that in your summary, your fact facilities fact sheet, you noted that two of the schools had wings added on at different points. And am I looking at it right that the only time any monies have really been invested for upgrades, repairs, major maintenance, not the day-to-day, -day, but the major stuff was the um, $10 million in 2016? To my knowledge, that's the only major capital cost, yes. But that's, I don't know if anyone else from the town can answer that, but that's to my I can, knowledge. I can answer that. Um, I forget what year it was, but there was a year, Sean, where we we um, we we budgeted, they budgeted. The town gave the schools 1.2 million dollars for capital. That was before the 10 million dollar budget. Right. Okay. So so 11 to 12 million dollars is all that has been put into these buildings. So it's no wonder that it's accumulated to to this this big lift. I, is is my my point. I just wanted to clarify that this is the only time we've had to in really invest and ask other than the 10 million. Uh, let's see. Uh, hold on. I did uh, field one of my questions with Matt. Oh, yeah. The um, on the list that you got for us late last week, Charlie, the list of what option E would complete. There were the purple highlighted items that were listed capital and green that were listed future. And could you just expound upon what those as a as groupings, what is going to happen with those? Sure, I'm going to turn this over to Ed from DBVW to answer those questions. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Ed. Hi, Ed. Um, the plan with the uh, conceptual scope of work, we had identified some items that were capital as well as future. And both of those items would need to be addressed in terms of the long-term planning for the schools on a yearly basis as part of capital. And as part of the stage two, we need to propose uh, what is included in a five-year capital improvement plan. That would be the things that would be identified as the capital. And then beyond that, beyond the five years, would be the things that were identified as future. So that could be from year six all the way out to year 20. So those are items that aren't critical right now. They can be addressed in that six to 10 year or whenever period? Correct. OK. Just one other question was outstanding for me. Uh, the I think you made one comment in one of the answers that the conceptual design cost for a Quidnick was 2.2 million and at Forest was 1.1 million. That's the cost of the work that is part of this $90 million proposal? Correct. So they are a very small percentage right now already. Yes. Okay. I, thank you very much. I'm just clarifying some of the loose ends, make it clearer to myself and the public as we go forward with the discussion and um, approval. Okay, thank you. Any other counselors? I have, I have one question. Tom. Um, could I ask Mark to explain um, how the money travels uh, from the lender through whatever checkpoints there are in the town or school and how it ends up at, um, at the vendor? Absolutely. So I'll start with the bond issue. When the bond is issued, the proceeds get deposited into a trust bank account. 
Uh, the school department records the revenue on their books in a capital projects bond fund, and they also record all of the expenses associated with the bond issue in their capital bond projects fund. Um, when they go out to bid, the school department is responsible for all bid processes regarding the bond projects. The school committee approves the vendor who they use for a certain project. When the vendor submits an invoice to the school department for payment, we have the project manager, architect, and facility management approve the invoice for payment. And then the school uh, finance office submits that invoice to the trustee, who then issues a check to the vendor. I am copied on all emails uh, to the trustee, and I maintain an Excel document that identifies where all the bond proceeds are spent, what school and what project. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Anybody, any councils like to comment? I got some. I want to say. Okay. Chris? <clears throat> so I want to just clarify something that Councillor Flynn brought up that was brought to light a second ago. I have problems believing that only $11 million have been spent on capital improvements in the schools over the course of their life. I guarantee you that there was some capital improvement dollars that were put in the annual school budget to address issues. So let's get that out of the table immediately because it wasn't just $11 million that were spent on the schools. I don't know what the total number is and maybe we can get that from the town administrator, department of finance director, but it wasn't that. It had to have been more. That's not, not even fathomable at that point in time to come with that. <clears throat> so, Charlie, again, great work. And you guys have put a lot of work into this. I was kind of kicking myself over the weekend. After we went through the workshop process. I sat back, I listened, I digested. I flipped through the documents again over the weekend. I lost a little bit of sleep on it. It's a big number. This is a bigger number. That's a bigger number. What, I, I, I understand that if we put option F in place, what would that look like for the halfway point? I know what do nothing is. Zero, I know, I understand completely what zero is, and that's not an option. We have to do something. But there's gotta be something in between. There's gotta be something in between option E and nothing. And I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if you guys explored it. I would wanna understand what that is. Because when I think about going out to bond for $90 million next year, $3 million of debt service with a 7% increase to the taxpayer at the rate it is today, that doesn't sound too horrible. But given the economic conditions and what may happen over the course of the next 10 years on the trajectory that we're on right now, it's not gonna be easy. And passing that burden on to the year-round resident who may be on a fixed income looks very simple in the spreadsheet that was provided by Mr. Brown, but there's a significant concern I have. That's another $3 million of annual debt we have to figure out how to pay for. And we haven't even factored in whether we're gonna spend the bond on open space and recreation, a new library. There's a thousand other moving pieces here. So it, I hate to throw this, this Hail Mary at the last second. What's the in-between? Is there something that we could do that comes not at a $90 million price tag, but at a half that still gets us that same level of reimbursements? just to meet that halfway, because I, I need to, and I know the voters are gonna determine whatever we put forward, they will decide on the ballot come November. This is a tough pill to swallow, especially looking at everything else the town has facing it, what's in front of it, and even just this year's budget, as I'm thinking about that process as well, we already know we have shortfalls that we have to find a way to solve for. So I, I hate to dump on you, it's a lot, but I've, I've lost sleep over this over the past few nights because it's, it's a big nut. We've never as a town, as far as I know, have gone to bond for anything more than what, $20 million? Ten. It's significant. Absolutely. This is a big lift. It's a big lift, it's a big decision. It's a big move for our, our schools though, and for our students, I mean, I'm. As a taxpayer, I worry more about if we don't do anything right now. What's that going to cost me as a taxpayer? Because I, I get that reimbursement. We're, these are, even if we got the 35% reimbursement on this, it's still $30 million. That's, that's a big number from the state. So, you know, I understand your concern. I think we've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort into 
presenting. You know, we purposely scaled back the elementary schools thinking there's more to come. You yeah. know, there's talk of universal pre-K, there's talk of the Navy expanding here. That's going to trigger something else we're going to have to do. And, and I think we've talked about that. We have some plans for that in the future. This won't be the last time. You know, that, that came up the last time. We are going to have to do something with a kid, a Quidnick school eventually. Does it make sense to put most of the money into that right now? I don't think it does. Um, I think what we presented with option E is the best option for the town of Middletown, in my opinion. Right. Mr. Santos. Where do you begin? You keep talking about a Quidnick school. What's going to happen to a Quidnick school? Is that going to be put on the list with Holland, Linden, Wyatt? And look at Oliphant. I'm ashamed to look at Oliphant. That is a disgrace to this town. Now, what happens to a Quidnick? Is that going to be torn down? You don't, school department or the town doesn't own the land. Do you know who owns the land? It has to remain a school, I know that much. I'm sorry? It's deeded to, uh, has to remain a school. It has to, who owns the land? Do you know? I do not know, no. John, the assigns of John Clark. Town does not own that land, neither does the school. All right, that brings me to another question. You keep talking about building repairs. Your own home, do you wait 10 years down the road to do repairs on your own home and combine them all together for thousands and thousands of dollars, or do you budget each year to do a certain repair on your own home, like I do? Me personally, I'm looking into doing a home equity um, to do that big project. I can't afford to do it every year. I can't afford it. All right. Do the, does the maintenance department or the janitors, like in my heyday and some of our other counselors, janitors and maintenance department did a lot of the work. Do we have a maintenance department? Do the janitors do any work? Do they repair anything? Like the janitors back in Mr. Madeiras' time? I, I've spent a lot of time going on tours of the schools and met them and they do a lot of work. They did, why are the present personnel doing any work on, the, on any of our schools? Of course, yes. Like they're, what? They're, like what? I, I don't know specifically, but I, I think, you know, the schools have outlived the life expectancy. They, we have gotten to this point. They are they're designed to last 50 years, and we're beyond that at this point. I they're, just cannot believe the Preservation Society in Newport. How does Breakers continue, continue to stand up? That should be down. That should have been knocked down years ago. But look at it. Why can't the town, why can't the school department do the same for our school buildings? Because they don't maintain them. Because they figure the taxpayers are gonna fund their money for people who do not even live in town. I don't wanna listen to you, Teresa. I'm not gonna listen to you. I've been in this town, I was born in this town. And I've seen the school department in its high rise, now it's down in its low rise. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Santos. You're welcome. And, and Mr. Roberts is, I mean, he doesn't work for the schools. He's just on the building committee. He's not going to have all, I understand the questions, and maybe that's why Teresa was going to get up, because he does not have those answers. Well, if Teresa wants that, to that answer you them, were going, go ahead. That you were asking. And I, was, I didn't want to interrupt you, because you were on fire. So, <laughs> Teresa, did you want to add something? I would, if that would be okay. Thank okay. You. Oh, Mrs. Santos, I certainly understand where you're coming from, and I, I respect the fact um, of, of the challenges that this bond could potentially bring, but I also want to um, mention that the part of the economic growth for this community is the attraction of a good educational system. So when we talk about the potential of the military, more military coming in, when military move here, they choose where they're going to live in, in one of our three districts based on the educational system. So that's a very important part about bringing more economic development and growth into our community to increase our revenues and make it an attractive 
place for families to live, buy homes. Um, the market right now in Middletown, homes are selling for astronomical prices. So, you know, it really is um, on a higher market right now. Uh, you had mentioned to Mr. Roberts about, you know, do you put all the money into your house or do you plan over a course of years? I think everybody does things differently. I think it depends on where the economy is. You know, I just bought the house I grew up in, which is 71 years old, and there's no way I could potentially live there and do this over a 10-year process. It's, it would never happen. I would never be able to sleep in the house until I finally put some money into it and made renovations, new furnace, new electrical, things like that. So when things get old and aged, if you don't repair them, there's potential of water pipes, which we've had recently. Um, there's potential of fire hazard hit issues. I mean, there's a lot of <coughs> issues. In regards to the work that our facilities department does, there are some things that our school, can, school department cannot do, even our town cannot do, if you don't have the professional skill set in the um, department. For example, certified electricians. You just can't have one electrician going around into thousands of square feet and trying to repair those. Certified plumbers, those kinds of things. Our facility guys do a tremendous amount. Um, but when you're talking about specialized roofing, um, furnaces, boilers, whatever you want to call them. I know they're whatever they do, but you know what I'm about, heating systems, HVAC. Uh, those are expertise things, just like in our house, I'm not going to change an outlet. I can do a lot of things, but I'm not climbing on a roof, and I'm not changing an outlet, and I'm not going to climb down and fix a toilet because I don't know how to do it. So realize that we do have a lot of expertise in our facilities department, and so does the town, and we do share those support, those services amongst, amongst our maintenance and facilities. But there are some things that are beyond that scope of the skill set that we have. Um, so that is where you have a you hire a, a group to come in and do those kinds of massive projects. Not only that, but they're coming in with a massive team, and they're able to produce a lot more. Um, they're able to get things done a lot faster than you have one electrician to servicing four buildings. In regards to Oliphant, in it, by doing this project in this bond, we're taking the administration out of Oliphant, relinquishing Oliphant to the town. The town then would have the ability to do what they choose with it, which is we talked about the um, affordable housing in that, on that property because it's right on a great location of West Main Road. So that property would be relinquished to the town, and then the town would be able to decide what they're going to do with it. So there is a positive of that aspect that Oliphant would not be um, having to need any money invested into it. So that's a savings in that respect, because if we use that and continue to use it as the school system, at some point we'd have to put some money in there to preserve that building as well. So just, to, does that help someone? Yes, thank, thank you, Teresa. I was referring to Little Oliphant, the little white building. I'm sorry, okay. All right. I understand. The inside of that has been knocked down. There, there were three rooms in that schoolhouse. The outside is a disgrace. The inside, I haven't been in it in years. I thought it was painted a few years ago. But a few years ago, it was painted. Right. But again, it's, do we invest the money in, in, into that, or do we take the money and go in, and do what we want to do with a larger scope to support our students? I could have some suggestions. We're not going to bring them up now. Um, my last question is, our school department, our schools, how do we rate in the town? Where do we stand? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Well, number one is Barrington, correct me if I'm wrong. Where do we stand as down the... Oh, in the state? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head, Teresa. I really don't, I don't know. Does anybody in the school department know? The last rating, the high school was um, like 15, 18, uh, and I don't know where the uh, other schools are. The metric that we've been using, we haven't been doing those state tests given the COVID, the pandemic. All right. And there haven't been any ratings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to make any comments? Mr. Welch. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> little lengthy. 
We're not here to debate how we got to this point of needed repairs. It already happened. It's easy to Monday, mor uh, Monday morning quarterback and say what we should have done. We all know a substantial amount of money has been spent on our schools and that money was put to good use, but the reality is more is needed. As we've heard from the experts on the committee, the work to replace the roofing and windows in the previous bond has made it possible for us to invest responsibly in our existing buildings rather than having to build new. Tonight we're here to talk about the work that still needs to be done to ensure our existing school buildings can continue to meet the needs of the town. As Paul said at the last meeting, I am in favor of this proposal and I'm very comfortable with it because I'm on the committee. So I have been able to ask questions, see all the research, the due diligence, and the effort that got us to this point. As with other boards and committees that the town has established, we do so to bring together experts in the field as well as interested taxpayers to investigate all sorts of issues and provide analysis and guidance to the council. In this case, I have the opportunity to participate as a liaison on, the, on this committee which helps bridge the gap between the council and the committee. I want to make sure everybody understands the task that this committee was charged with. After identifying all the deficiencies from every angle, the resulting list had to be crafted into a plan that would address the problems in a way that respects our fiscal responsibility as taxpayers, while trying to maximize the reimbursement opportunities currently available from the state, and take advantage of construction efficiencies as much as possible. This lengthy process resulted in five options. Option E is being recommended because it addresses as many of those deficiencies as possible while keeping the price tag within the town's ability to successfully attain uh, funding through a bond. Personally, I want to fix it all now. Everything we put off will only cost more down the road and it will create a heavier maintenance burden along the way. Realizing this is out of our financial reach, I believe option E is the best way forward. Uh, we all know that Terry asked a lot of questions. Not necessarily a bad thing, and often they have merit. I absolutely agree that you make the best decisions when you have all the information, and you get information by asking questions. The proposal in front of you does not contain every piece of information that we would like to have. But that's not because the questions haven't been asked or the research is incomplete. As an example, we talked about this last time, it'd be great if RIDE's application timeline dovetailed with the state's house agenda with respect to the bonus extensions. But it doesn't. Committee members well versed in this area who have their ears to the ground, have given us their expert opinions. The information we have is as good as it gets, and I'm confident that the proposal has been thoroughly evaluated using the most up-to-date data. I wanted to have my mom speak tonight to support this effort. I'm still hoping I can get uh, her to make an appearance before the ballot voting, but I want to share a little bit of her story because I think it speaks to the experience of many of our longtime residents. My parents grew up in Newport but moved to Middletown to buy their home and raise a family. And when the three of us went off to school, which was the late 60s, early 70s, these same schools we're talking about today provided the framework for our education. My parents didn't pay for them to be built. Those that came before them did. But as residents, they've been paying taxes to maintain the schools for the past 60 years. My mom was a career educator. All three of her children and four of her grandchildren attended Middletown schools. Currently, six great-grandchildren are, are headed our way. Uh, she went with me to tour Quidnick. She spoke with some of the teachers, talked to the kids, saw firsthand the current conditions. She came away very concerned with what she saw, particularly for the younger children. Now, she's a senior, now a widow, on a fixed income, living on her, in her own house in Middletown, she fully supports this proposal. Because she knows that education is the foundation of our community. And if we don't provide our children the school facilities they need, our community and our society will suffer. We know our schools are important, as evidenced by the fact that we put so much effort and money toward them. Last year, it was 57% of our budget. 
No one, myself included, would volunteer to increase taxes on a whim. But taxes have to increase to cover the operating expenses of the town, which includes maintaining its infrastructure, and in this case, the schools. The proposal outlined here is not an outlandish ask. The bulk of the work will replace plumbing, heating, and fire safety equipment, roofing, windows, and doors. Due to the scope of the work, we'll also be able to incorporate some flexibility into our buildings by creating open spaces and providing some new furniture that can accommodate multiple classroom arrangements and be used for a variety of purposes. So here we are. In front of us, we have the culmination of literally hundreds of hours of work resulting in a reasonable and workable proposal to address the needs of our schools. Now I know from a council perspective, it's a lot of information to digest and we're looking at a very big price tag. Our job as councilors in my eyes is to forward the committee's recommendation to the voters to decide if they agree. I'm confident we can get there tonight. Agreeing to put this decision on the ballot in no way obligates us to borrow any money or sign a contract. It simply lets the taxpayers have their say in November and allows the stage two application to move forward. The education of our children, which is facilitated by these buildings, directly impacts our quality of life in Middletown. I hope we can get all on the same page and vote in favor of moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> well, all right. Dennis. Any comments? No, I'm fine for right now. You're Thanks. good? Okay. So I'd like to make a few comments as well. Um, I like Chris, I'm sure, like all the counselors, you know, every seems like every free moment I have, even at, whether it's at work or not at work, it's pretty much all I'm thinking about is, is, is the town's finances and, you know, how we would pull this off. Our job as counselors is to, no matter what's brought before us, uh, any dollar amount, any budget, any bond is to filter that information um, and, and, and make the best uh, decision for our taxpayers, whether it's today, tomorrow, or 50 years from now. Um, I had a conversation with somebody today that, that told me, said, hey, you know, we were talking about the bond and we were talking about education, and they said something to me that kind of stuck out a little bit, and I never really gave it much thought to that. We always think about education because, you know, it's kind of, you know, I look back 40 years ago, I graduated, and I still can't believe it, but anyway, um, it's, it's a much different 40 years ago than it was today, and we know that's gonna change, right? So, you know, some of the money that we wanna put in, uh, this person said to me, you know, education even 20, 25, 30 years from now is not gonna, be, we don't know what it's gonna be. Just like we didn't know what it's gonna be 40 years ago when I graduated. So as it continues to evolve, um, you know, how much of that money do we really need to put into some of this stuff? Because we're not sure where, where education will be. Who knows? Having said that, um, I just kind of like to recap some of the current finances um, and some of the future finances based on the information we have. So just bear with me. I may jump around a little bit. I'm doing the best I can here with uh, taking notes as I was listening. Um, so I just would like to say that I don't think that we should make any decision until we have a total picture of what it would cost a taxpayer. Now we know what it would cost, option E, we know what that would cost. We know that, right? But we don't know, we shouldn't really make that decision. And I know there's time frames that the committee has to meet and, and um, but I'd like to see, personally me, I'd like to see what this year's budget is going to bring because we could potentially start you know um, I know you said that the state Rosemary may hold the town whole uh, harmless for the 1.3 million that's this year whether we whether that gets funded or not we don't know that yet that's 1.3 million okay 863,000 was used in fund balance for the schools to fund their their schools that's not coming back, okay? So potentially, and we're assuming, just like we're assuming in some of the figures that Mark gave us and some of the figures that uh, we have in front of us, 
We have three school contracts coming. And as Sean said, the, 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 uh, whether it's the teachers, whether it was the teacher's aides, whether it was the custodians, whether it was the police, whether it was the fire, whoever it was, you know, we did a lot of 1% rollovers. I'm not sure that's sustainable. They helped us. So we have teachers coming up. The last teacher contract, we started $500,000 first year, right off the bat. So you can count on that. So 1.3, 863, at least 500, just from the teacher's contract, which is the most, probably the most expensive one because it has the most employees. Okay, then we have the teacher's aides, custodians. That's all before we even start the budget process. So there's a lot of unknowns, and for me to sit here and make a decision based on saying, okay, well, it can go up on the average home of 300,000. To me, that's on the low end of an average home in Middletown. I think you're probably talking more like four or 500,000. And those are numbers, those show, knows the numbers better than anybody. But that's an average, and, and I, I think it's probably more the way that the, the, uh, the assess and that's on today's assessments. Okay, and once you put anything in the tax rate, it's not coming out. It's never coming out. We gotta think about how things compound. So, um, so right now, we have um, 26.1 million in outstanding debt. So, th basically what I heard was we're in an okay position with our outstanding debt right now. There's a potential on top of, before you even get to the 90, of a $24.5 million with, and this includes the interest, of $6 million for open space, $12 million for the library, and $1 million of, of, for the school maintenance construction. Okay? So if you take those two numbers, now you're at $50 million, $50.6 million. That's before we start a budget. That's bef that doesn't include the 1-3, the 863, or the contracts. Or the 90 million. So I had a conversation with Mr. Brown because I'm nervous about this. This is a big number. You guys have done a great job. Is the need there? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Now, it's what you can afford to do and what you can't afford to do at the same time, right? Because someone could say, like Tom tells me all the time, you know, it's going to be more expensive down the road. Well, so is everything. It's what you can afford to do. And I agree with that, or not do. Well, you add the, 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 the 26, one, the 24, five, the, which equals the 50.6, add 90 million to that, you're at $140 million. That's before the other budgets. Um, I had a conversation with Sean because I was nervous. And I'm still nervous about it. Um, if, you know, if money started falling out of the sky, I'd say, let's do it. Let's do it all right now like Tom. Let's get it done. I can't support that today. I can't support it right now. I don't know what the total dollar is going to be to increase the taxpayers. You're talking, uh, we know what it's going to be for the bond. We don't know what it's going to be for the budget. So if it's an additional, I just add a $300,000 assessment, it's an additional $264, right? Might not seem a lot less than a dollar a day, right, Teresa? That's what we talked about on Friday, right? And you kind of put it simple, and it, it, it kind of swayed me a little bit. And, um, but, <laughs> um, so, but that's, that's, that's before any of this, and that's a today's assessment. So is there a need there? Absolutely. Do I think we need to do something? Absolutely. I don't think it's 90 million today. I just don't. That's just my opinion. Um, based on, based on all the other numbers I'm seeing. So when I talked to Sean, I said, you know, for the first time in almost 20 years of working with Mr. Brown, you know, Mr. Brown said to me, I'm worried. So we had the conversation. So, um, look, he's the financial guy. Um, he knows the town finances better than I do. I think this stretches us way too far at this point in time. I agree with Chris. I'd like to see something, a potential other option. You know, our, our obligation is safe, dry, and warm. That's our obligation. Do we want to do more? I wish we could do it all. But I think we need to be very careful with these numbers and very careful proceeding. It's not sustainable going forward. 
It's just not. Because people that can't afford it, you know, people on fixed incomes, whoever it is, they're not going to be here. And guess what? You don't know they're out of the town, but you're out. And that's not our job. Our job is to create that balance. So I'd like to see a little bit more balance um, with where we're at. Inflation's going through the roof. You know, where's that going to go? We have no idea. So, yeah, it's a dollar a day um, right now, today. Uh, but again, once that's built in, it doesn't come back. It's very expensive to live here. People aren't getting raises. Most people are not getting raises. Um, we have increased contractual labor costs. We talked about that. Chris touched on the three point. We all saw the slide. 3.3. We had it over the weekend. 3.3 before the weekend in debt every year for 20 years. We need to figure out how to pay for that. Um, so, and again, that's all before the start of the budget. I just don't think we can, we can stretch the town this thin at this point. It's dangerous. Is it nice? Would it be great? It'd be awesome. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, my, our fiduciary responsibility is to make sure that the town is solvent, not just today, but down the road. And I think this just stretches the town too, too thin with, uh, with, the, with the, all the other things that we have going on as well. Um, so um, in my opinion, I just don't think we should make any decisions until we know what the total cost of the taxpayer is going to be, and that includes the budget. Um, you know, we have not in the past, and I certainly will not make a decision, a financial uh, decision burdening the tax re residents without all the information and looking at the total picture for this year. Um, again, our job as the councils is to, we could very easily say, yep, go right ahead, throw it out to the taxpayers. To me, that's not doing my job. Sorry. My job is to make sure, our job is to make sure that we filter this for the taxpayers because they don't know what we know. That's why they elect us. They don't know all the other things going on in town. They don't know the long-term forecasts. If somebody said to me, a dollar a day, hey, okay, go, go for it. No problem. They don't see the total picture. They don't. We have <clears throat> the next group up is the Beach Committee tonight. They're looking for improvements as well. You know, where does all this money come from, folks? It comes from the taxpayer. That's where it's coming from. So. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see something else. Well, we have to do something. I don't know what that number is. Um, I talked to Sean about it earlier. Um, for me, I'd like to see Charlie and your group, again, something has to be done, but it's what we can afford to do. And I'm not gonna stretch the taxpayer that thin, I'm just not gonna do it. And put the town, in the future, borrowing, you don't know what's gonna come up um, in jeopardy as well, so. That's my opinion. Um, Mr. Welch. A number of things. I know that the numbers that you just reiterated are numbers that we heard tonight, but mixing bond numbers and the fund balance from the school I don't think is is correct because the, the bond numbers that made your 50 whatever million dollars is the total amount. It's not what we pay on an annual basis. So if you're gonna put an annual number out there, you have to, you have to be apples and apples, first of all. Uh, second of all, I think that when you talk about a direct hit on the taxpayer, um, and you and I, we've discussed this as a group, uh, I I'm um, completely against the fact that you were able to not raise taxes for a number of years in a row. And I think the reason that the town was able to continue on ahead is because there are other ways the town can get revenues that don't necessarily impact the taxpayer directly. Um, I don't quite understand when you said once you put something in the tax rate, it never comes out. Um, I don't understand that because at the end of the year, whatever the town's needs are, the mill rate is adjusted to achieve that a number. So, you know, whatever we put into the tax rate this year, if it's not necessary next year, then it get, it's adjusted. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. When, um, you, when you go out for a bond, mm -hmm. when you, that bond's built into the tax rate, mm -hmm. when the debt's paid off, yep. 
doesn't come out. Well, maybe that gets shifted over to some other bond that you have, <coughs> but, but that bond is paid off and you're not still paying on it. So I'm anyway. Just telling you how it works. Okay. Right. And, and believe me, okay. absolutely it could be wrong here. I'm just giving you my gut uh, from listening to you. Understood. Um, <coughs> and I'll throw this out there too. The, the $12 million that's in your, your bond package there for the library, mm -hmm. if we listen to the West Main Road <coughs> development, we can recover that cost by using the income that the property generates and effectively end up with a free library. So there are other, there are other factors here that hit on those numbers. So uh, I, I don't know where we're going here, but I will just say this, that um, we all have a front row seat uh, watching Newport struggles with their aging schools. I think we are still upriver of their predicament, but we're in the same river. <clears throat> we have an opportunity to avoid their situation. I think we all agree we need to address the infrastructure in our schools. We have a well-crafted recommendation from our building committee, which allows us to take advantage of state money that will cover almost half of the entire project. Um, I spoke with Mr. Brown as well, and I don't know, I don't want to put him on the spot, but at the same time, I did not think, get the impression that he was worried. Um, okay. I got the impression that, as a matter of fact, I think the word he used was bold, that this would be a, a, a bold move, not, not, I almost said a bad word, uh, not a, uh, an irresponsible move, but, you know, like we're, we're addressing a need that's in front of us, the numbers are possible, I'm not saying comfortable, but it, it doesn't get any better. The further we go, it, it doesn't get more easy or comfortable. And as long as it is possible, um, well, anything's I, possible I, if I you raise the that. rate, no. tax rate. Right. Anything's possible. But you can't just keep going without raising the tax rate. I'm not saying not do anything. I'm uh, saying we do something. I'm just saying we don't do nothing. Forty-five cents though. on the dollar. So what I want to ask you now, procedurally, okay, because I don't know where everybody is. But to keep this on task, I would like to make a motion that we allow it to go yeah, forward. Yeah, anybody can make a motion. Teresa. I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm an educator, obviously, early childhood, as you know. And, edu and children are our future. If we do not plant the seeds and provide them the knowledge, they're not going to be our future stories. So in providing that safe, dry, and warm environment is not sufficient. We need them an educational environment, a learning environment, with the tools and the necessities of, of what they need to grow and develop. And who knows, somebody here from Middletown could be the next president of the United States. We don't know what the are doing. Never know. Um, but the other thing, um, you know, in this town, in order to make this town attractive, well, att attractive, we built a beautiful new police station. We have invested in vehicles this year. Um, we expanded and, and built and remodeled our beautiful new fire department. We've expanded their staff and vehicles. It is the same thing. Our town is growing. We wouldn't have expanded those two facilities if our community wasn't growing. So if we're expanding in those communities, on that aspect of fire and safety and health and safety of our community, it really is important to understand the educational aspect. Again, people will, will come to a community like this and move to our town if it's attractive and has an educational system for their children. That's how we're going to bring young families back into this community, because they're going to be looking at the educational system. The other thing I wanted to mention was, we're, and Tom just said this, um, we're not paying back $90 million. This might be the only opportunity to get this kind of reimbursement. So we'd be paying back $46 million. There's a big difference. That's a huge difference of percentage that we're, I know we have to borrow 90, but we're going to get reimbursed, and that reimbursement was, was explained before of how that works. We're going to pay back 60-some million with interest is what we're paying back, not mm -hmm. 46. Mm -hmm. Right, with, in, with interest, you correct, I'm sorry. 46 million plus interest, so we're with 66 million, but it's not 90 million plus interest. 
because we're getting that reimbursement back. So either way, we're still saving millions of dollars. And the last thing I wanted to mention was, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe that tonight's proposal, what we're, we're asking for tonight is a vote to move forward to stage two. Correct me if I'm wrong, this is not a final commitment of a bond. The bond has not even been proposed yet because I would have to go up to Secretary in, in Wendy, March, April, May, right? Well, it has to go to bond council first. That's what I mean. When does that have to happen? They would need that by May. Correct? Okay. So, so, so this. Come back by May. So they would need it by April. Okay. So April. This decision tonight is to move to step stage two phase to be able to submit. What's the word called? The schematic, schematic um, design. Schematic, right? Did I say that right? The schematic design. So this is not about committing to ninety million dollar bond yet. It's, it's asking for approval for a cost estimate of the $90 million. That's okay. what it's asking. And so right. why would we let it travel that way if, you know, certainly I'm going to say what, how I feel about it, and I don't feel that, you know how I feel now. Um, why would we let it continue to go down that road and all of a sudden just go, well, no. As Matt said earlier on the um, screen, he said that there's potential of even more reimbursement. So based on the schematic design that gets submitted and Ride looks at it and, and goes from there, that was my understanding of that, is that there was potentially more, I'm sorry, bonus points, right? Bonus points. Um, so I just, I think that it's important to, to hone down into what this is about. This is about moving this to the next stage. There's no commitment to doing that bond right now without doing this. So I think that we, if we've, discuss this in great length, and I think it's important to be able to move this to stage two, have Ride look at the schematic design, and go from there. At the last meeting on the 10th, we told Charlie we'd have, an, the committee, we'd have an answer for him on, the, on whether we wanted to proceed with, with what option. That, that's what this is about, Teresa. It says right here. Yes, to go to, to, go to phase two. Conceptual design and cost estimates. Right. That's to, what it's about. To go to stage two. And Step in here, Charlie. And yeah, I, the what we're asking for is exactly that. We don't want to go down the road. Yeah. For ninety million dollars, if if that's not going to be supported, it, it also we are asking this to to go down that road and to turn it over to the to the voters. Is what we're really asking to do. But we also don't want to go down a road to ninety million dollars um, without support. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, I guess my question is, as we were talking the last time, it was $90 million. We're about 50% of that was variable costs based on construction, you know, getting started and to this next level to determine, is it truly $90 million? Can we do all the work that you're recommending for $90 million, Or could we do it for less? Is that... Is that the question we could get answered if we let this move forward? That's what the schematic designs will do. We'll, we'll, schematic designs will give us even more information to continue to bid this out and to right. refine our numbers. Right. So I think the conversation was also around like, okay, then we would prioritize it. The, like if the voters didn't have an appetite for 90 million, would they have an appetite for 45 million? And if we did 45 million, what would you recommend us to do? Was that, I thought we had that conversation a little bit the last time. Yeah. Uh, good, e Excuse me? Yeah, good evening. Um, good evening. Just your, name, your name and address for the record, please. Uh, Doug Brown, uh, Principal DVUW Architects. Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I just, just to kind of reiterate the consequences or the importance of establishing a target budget. Um, I think clearly the, the work of this committee and, and our organization uh, in coming to uh, option E uh, believes that that is the most prudent balance between maximizing the uh, impact of, of town uh, uh, funds um, and making a dent on these schools. And as Tom pointed out, so much of the work is based on having to replace 
uh, very old infrastructure. Um, but the importance of agreeing on the number from the, from the onset is that in developing the schematic design, we're, we're working towards that number. There is flexibility built in, but in the cost estimate was, that was um, established to date, those contingencies anticipated that. Um, uh, yes, there's the possibility that there are the true costs as we develop the schematic design will change. They could go up a little bit, they could go down a little bit, but those contingencies are designed to address those. But the, but the method of implementing the work is as important a consideration. In other words, um, we are proposing to rent portable classrooms to facilitate work being completed during the school year. Th these are big projects that will be disruptive to the student body. We want to minimize that disruption. That's another argument for doing as much as you can at once. If you, if you have to cut the work in either the middle school or the, or the high school in half, it means thinking about the implications of doing the half that you didn't get done now with respect to those portable classrooms. But back to the point and the challenge at hand, and I, I think I said it the very first time I talked to the committee, what, what we want to help the town with is to come up with a strategy that is the most impactful, but also if you, if you can't do it all, which obviously we can't, is to help you think about how what doesn't get done eventually gets done and the cost of that. And um, that's a hard thing to figure out. And, and I don't think there's time, if, if the proposal is to wait until you understand that cost, I think we're up against a very difficult situation relative to our timeline and the timeline for the ride submission. Because really, we have a very short window of time because of when the bond uh, 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 p uh, process has to commence in early May to complete the work, that is the schematic design uh, package, prepare that cost estimate, which is the most important cost estimate, it'd be very detailed, it's a huge amount of work, and then once we have that in hand, going back, and this is where that flexibility comes in, make any adjustments we can to the final scope of work so that it, it aligns with the reality of that cost estimate. These cost estimates, each time they're done, factor in the best information that is hand at that moment. So inflation, trending of materials, supply chain issues, all of those things are factored in. It might be a little different when they do it in April than, than the last time. So what I don't think is possible is to say, let's move forward with a $90 million project, thinking that, that you might be able to build in 10 or $20 million of flexibility in it and then tailor it later. I don't think that's possible. We, we really need to know a, a target number to start our work responsibly. And, it, and as much as anything else, that's attributable to, uh, as I said earlier, the, the implementation, the way it's implemented, phasing. Phasing the work ha has everything to do with the cost. It's, a, it's one of the most impactful ways to to minimize the cost actually is to develop an efficient phasing strategy. But without knowing uh, the target bond, then that's pretty hard to do. You can't build in those kinds of, that kind of flexibility into the cost. Yeah, I understand that, Doug. And, and we're in the kind of the same predicament of, you know, how do we figure out what the complete cost of the taxpayer would be without knowing where we're even starting on our budget? So your timelines aren't lining up yeah. And that's not a good thing, for me anyway. I, I, it just I, I doesn't. Understand. And I'm not, I'm certainly, I'm one vote, but I'm certainly not going to allow to be rushed because of, a, of, a, of your timeline. 
The only timeline I'm concerned about, and I'm sure that everyone up here is concerned about, is the affordability timeline, the sustainability timeline of our taxpayers. I understand that. And I, I know I, you do. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I, I uh, <coughs> you know, there, there is, there doesn't seem to be, unless there's flexibility with, with respect to the deadline for the, for the uh, bond, you know, um, uh, determination. There there's, there's not much, there's no flexibility in our schedule. I'm Understood. just making that point. Understood. Um, oh, and that, that and then finally, the, and I just think the last thing I'd say, and, and I said this earlier too, is our hope certainly is that whatever, th whatever this project is envisioned and in, in, endorsed here at the town council level, it becomes, uh, you know, something that can be, th no one wants to go through this process and have a failed referendum. That is, you know, it's a waste, of, it's a huge waste of, of resources and funds. And, uh, and no one wants to see that happen. So we're really hoping to develop a, a solution here that allows it to move forward quickly enough to get this package done. Because the other thing we don't want to do is to rush that package. You know, we want to do our job as thoroughly as we possibly can. And so I just point Understood. that out. Understood. Council of Toronto. Yes, just to, I appreciate that. So basically you're saying, you know, this is it's 90 million or you're better off not doing anything, is what I'm hearing you say. No, 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 no. No, that's not, not, not what all. you said. No, I said, I said if it's not 90, Give us we a hope target that's not number. the answer. Give them a target number. We really need a number. Right, but there was also the, the key that you said, there are certain things you have to do first before you can do something else. And if you are doing something with plumbing, for example, you're gonna have to do A, B, and C while you're doing that, or that's gonna be a problem. So to me, I'm saying, what is that grassroots to make that foundation stable so that we can expand in the future, just as an inquiry, okay? And then the timelines that we're up against here one is the state in regards to reimbursement, right? We were told that during unification of the schools. Now is the time you're never gonna get another bite at the apple. Well, here we are again, they've got money again. So we're getting another bite at the apple. Doesn't mean we won't get another bite at the apple three years from now, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. We could go to bond again. That's... As for the bond, we can have a special election and put it out there. It's about. 20, I'm not even sure what the special election would cost us these days, but it's nothing compared to the amount of money that this bond's gonna cost us. So if we wanted to go and have a special election once we figured out all the details and what we could absorb, I'm just putting that out for discussion, okay? And then I thought the financial impact or the debt ratio and so on that they're using for Moody and, and the ratings and so on. I mean, we use that in our going to a bank and getting a loan for your house and so on. We're right, if we go through this looking at the numbers, we're right at the peak, you know, of, of the amount that you should be borrowing and things along those lines. Two or three years from now, after that, four years, it comes down because we do have some bonds that we're retiring. So our debt to income, you know, the ratio will be there. So. Just things to consider. Those yeah. things that I'm going through in my head. Yeah. And uh, so appreciate all your hard work, though. Thank you. Councilor Von Dill. Yeah. I'm, uh, I can't help thinking about what for me would be the, the most important thing, and that would be the November referendum. And I've been there, as I told you people when we met in the very first meeting, I've been there and those people who are sitting here, many of them have been there too. And it took three times to get any money at all. So I worry about that. And, I, and I'm, what I say, what I think is that a lot of it depends on how well it's sold. Because as I'm thinking about this community and the tax rate and the tax increase, I'm thinking about people like me that are educators that care about the kids. 
and the people that are just trying to survive. And they're not the same, even if they care about the kids. They have to put food on their table. They have to pay for their rent or their mortgage. And, and so this is a, a, a diverse community in terms of economics. I am very concerned about the possibility, the possibilities of approval of, of a $90 billion bond issue. At the same time, I also know that if you sell something well, if you sell it in the language that people understand, not the stuff that we've been talking about here, not the, the finances that sometimes go over my head, quite frankly, um, or, or a lot of the other things that take place here, because the public that people talk about, they don't understand those things. They understand them less than I do, and I've been doing this, this is my seventh term. So it, it makes a difference with what you sell and, and who, whom you are talking to and how you say it and what you say to them. So in my mind, as everyone's been talking, I've been thinking about the possibilities of passing a bond issue of $90 million. And I'm not sure, OK? But I also know that if you don't try, you don't succeed. And if you try and you fail, you just come back again and again if it's necessary. So um, I don't like a $90 million bond issue. I don't like it. I don't feel good about it. I'm not hopeful. And I surely, if you decided to, if it was decided to go ahead, I would like to work with some of the advertising, so to speak, because that to me is key. But even if it fails, it's, it's raised the, the uh, awareness of the townspeople to a need, which I don't think they know about now, OK? So from my perspective, I don't want to support this. But as an educator, I would have to support it. And, and hope for the best and work for it. That's what I would have to do. Uh, Terry, Terry's been waiting. Terry. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. It's, it's valuable conversation and discussion, and it does need to happen. Uh, you know, the council president spoke of unknown liabilities and unknown numbers. And what about, I have to wonder, you know, what about the income side of that? Whenever you have unknown liabilities, you also have the potential of unknown incomes. Project like West Main Road, for example, that we're, you know, we currently have been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, there's two sides and, and there's two pots, you know, we have, I always think of the, all of a sudden, the things that we actually have in our, our um, asset base that we didn't realize, like a million dollars in a West Main Road fund that we used a third of um, to pay for tennis courts. There's still a million left there, if I understand correctly. You got 700,000 in cart money um, for under waste management. We've got beach income. Um, and, and what won't parents do for their kids? You know, there's, there are um, certainly the unknown liabilities can be balanced with the unknown income. I, I think I'd like to present to your point, Paul. Um, I think what we're hearing is the 90 million. I think that we have chewed 
this number, we as a council, I, I'm very impressed with the amount of information that the seven of us have poured over and through and been presented and thought about and lost sleep over. And it appears that the 90 million is the best return for the investment in all scenarios. Paul, you said it, this is a need. There needs to be a solution. And that's really what the town council needs to address. And the request today is to approve the conceptual design and the cost estimate. It's just an estimate. This is the solution recommended by the experts. The, the information has been filtered, I alluded to earlier, by the school building committee, by the council, by town staff, town administrator, finance department, the professional architects, um, the school committee. RIDE will decide if the buildings are worthy and they're, they're going to take a, another look at it. The bond gurus were just here tonight and they did not say the town could not do this. N nobody has said this, that it's very doable. And they said it with, with counting in library bond and recreation bond, take them out. Just look at what the students need right now, what they needed five, 10 years ago. If, if the town hasn't been told that that it's not doable, that Middletown can't do it, then Middletown is, is able to do it. And it really should be up to the taxpayers. What are their priorities? It's not what my priority is. We, we show that it can be funded. And if it fails, there are projects planned without the bond. That was in the Q&A series. On this topic, I, I feel that um, we, it's our obligation to move it on and let, let it continue getting filtered and developed and, and get to up to the, the taxpayer. If something along the ways, it's still early in the process. I don't think this is you know, necessarily binding. We could run into something in, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for, you know, Charlie and team, if something comes up down the line that it looks like it's, it's going to be impossible. Interest rates go up 5%. We're not going to put it on the ballot. Is that true, Charlie? Like if something extraordinary happened? Yeah, the town, I mean, we would put this to bond. And then after that, then you would have to do a, um, an agreement with the state anyway. So there, there'd still be ways to adjust it even at that point. There's a certain percentage we'd have to spend, correct? It's fifty percent. So we'd have to we'd have to spend at least fifty percent of that bond amount. And there would be reimbursements to qualify for that fifty percent portion. Yes. Thank you. I, I don't see the downside. I think this is a path to a solution that's desperately needed in Middletown. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Terry. I'd like to hear what the town administrator has to say. John. I have a lot of scribble on my pad. Um, <laughs> and actually, at the top, it's, it's interesting. And it sort of, Mrs. Von Villas sort of made me think back a little bit. So I, I got here in February of 2000. And, and I, I want to explain. I, I think this is a bold plan. It's an interesting plan because if we proceed down this path, we are making the, an investment in our schools, and it's a, it's a path that leads over a period of 10 plus years, and, and I'm just going to go through that because I, I just want to honor what I said to Mr. Welch and what I said to Paul. So as I understand this plan, we're going to invest in Middletown High School, and we're going to invest in the Gaudé Middle School. And the level of that investment is going to, as I understand it from the building committee meetings, is extend the useful life of those buildings. So rather than having an obsolescence at 50 years, they're going to have some sort of obsolescence at 75 plus years. And, and that's sort of what we do in Middletown. We try to make things last. And I, and I just want to back up a little bit. We've also taken a vote 
that we want our own school system here in Middletown. So now we sort of own it. That's, that's another reality to the way I think of this. Um, the committee had a recommendation, option C, at $170 million, a really big number. And as I understand it, and again, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, we basically backed off the elementary schools to get down to this $82 million number. So just before I get to my next point, we would have to do the work at Middletown High School and Gaudet Middle School now, and we'd have to do it right. It would have to be complete. We wouldn't want to roll forward stuff into my next part of the discussion, which is the elementary schools. Um, the discussion with the building committee gets a little fuzzy, but it sounds like because we're gonna postpone the elementary schools and with the new requirements that are coming down the road and the other things that are going on, that 10 years from now, if I'm sitting here, I guess I could still be sitting here, I won't be 65, we'll be talking about another bond. So if I just take the 168 and 82, there's another 82, I hear elementary schools cost 75, whatever it's gonna be, in 10 years we're gonna be talking about 75 to 100 million dollars. So here's one of those things that worries me are we going to roll are we going to defer maintenance now on the middle school and the Gaudet school roll that deferred expense into the discussion we're going to have 10 years from now to deal with the elementary schools and i think matt sort of talked about this with the capital plan we, we've got to layer the capital plan and understand what that that 20-year horizon is so going back to the bold comment to mr welch the decision we're making is one of long-term investment in our school infrastructure. We're saying that we're going to have to, we're gonna, we're gonna make Middletown High School and Gaudet Middle School last another 25 plus years. But we're also, what we're not saying tonight, and I guess I'm saying it now, I think we're recognizing that the elementary schools, we're gonna maintain them for a period of time, but they might actually get to their, their obsolescence and have to be replaced 10 years out. I think that's, that's part of the plan that we're contemplating with option E, and I guess part of that is the committee trying to balance out the current cost um, and not seeking out that option C. Um, back to being worried with Paul. We would have to execute the plan, and that, that's what worries me. It, it worries me because we have councils every two years we have priorities that change all the time. So while I sit here today and say, we're gonna make Middletown High School and Gaudet School right, you've gotta contemplate the fact that there's five additional councils to the point where you're gonna say, and now it's time to replace the elementary schools. Um, we look at the schedules and I, I use the, you know, we're sort of at the, whether they're guide rails or margins, we're gonna be back at the guide rails and margins at 10 years. And that's, that's another point I wanna bring up. We're sort of going to live with a maxed out credit card for a long time. And that's something else we need to understand. And that goes back to, and I, and I respectfully apologize to Paul for being a real crank pot at the last meeting. And I, you I, were. I was. And I, All right, I was too. And the apology was due. Um, <laughs> Just but, kidding. you know, I sat in the meeting and we were talking about ARPA and we were going to start this program and that program and this program and that program. And I'm sort of sitting there doing the math on this and it's like, you know, we're spending a lot of money. Like it's, we're really spending a lot of money, which then takes us to the other option thing, which is the school budget needs to be balanced. Um, and it needs to be balanced. And I, I think a lot of communities have a challenge with COVID, but, but we still have to balance it just like we balance our budgets at home. So that's, that, that is a point of worry. So when I started, I, I made the comment about Mrs. Von Billis and sort of looking back in a weird way, I felt like when I first got hired in February of 2000 and it was the five for one bond with the town of Middletown. Um, so whereas right now we're talking about having to balance the school budget, when I was hired, it was about balancing the town budget. Uh, there was a bond on the, on the, on the, the ballot. I also probably, if you told me that was the bond today, I would call it bold. We're gonna build a fire station, a police station, a senior center, and a couple other things. It was, um, it was bold, and 
and voters really didn't like it. And it was a lot of work in the finance <coughs> office. I can remember April of 2000 being in the conference room with Lynn Diable, the finance director, pulling our hair out, just trying to figure out how to get through, really, in, in a lot of ways, trying to finish an audit, trying to balance a current year budget, and trying to figure out how to get the next budget to work. And probably in the back of my mind, hoping that I wasn't gonna have to wrestle the bond that potentially was gonna be approved that night because it was just gonna complicate things more. So I think what I'm trying to explain is, yes, I think it is a bold plan. And I think just like everybody tonight, we need to address the capital needs with the school department. And we need to do it because the buildings need attention, but I also think it goes back to our decision that we are gonna have our own Middletown school department. We weren't gonna consolidate with another community. We were gonna provide, I've, I've used this word, a, a boutique experience for our young people where we were gonna focus on them in a small environment that's a Middletown environment. And this is part of that decision. And again, the boldness comes from the amount of money and the long-term investment. And again, the worry of that is the budget situation that we have to resolve, and we'll resolve that, but also the, the long-term commitment of the community to actually follow through with this piece, understanding that, that that point in time 10 years out is gonna be equally as important. Um, just some things, I'm just looking here, phasing of work is important, and I think you know, that's, that's one of those things. The project management team is gonna to have to be exemplary in this environment, I think. Um, the economic environment will worsen over time as interest rates continue to increase and we have to pay for the money that's out in the environment right now. Um, but I think it is, it is, it is a tough decision. And again, I, I don't, I just want to make it clear how I make that. I, I am restless about it. I, you know, I just, I, Again, going back to when I was, was sort of grouchy the last meeting, it's there's so many needs and we're arbitrating them all and we're worried about the residents. Um, I think it's uh, maybe in the end the, the hard part is just it's, it's the management. Paul asked me the question, do, you know, where are you on this? And, I, I, my reluctance is in the management of, of getting through not only this, but the next 10 years and with changing priorities. And then the ability of the leadership not to go off in other directions. That, you know, it, uh, the future leadership is gonna have to honor the fact that we went down this path. Um, I think those are my comments about it. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if that helps, but. Mr. Viveris. Thank you, Mr. President. Anton Valveros, one Admiralty Drive, Apartment 11. Um, you know, Mr. Baum talks about maxing out the town's credit card. How about the person who's trying to make ends meet at home, who has to pay, who has to max out their credit card for food and electric because they got to pay their taxes? If they don't pay their taxes, the town's going to put a lien on their house. That creates a problem. Now, if this goes through, what I, I hear here, a house that's assessed at $400,000, the tax is going to go up $250. And businesses is going to go up $560. Where are these people going to get that money? Government doesn't have any money until they take it from somebody. And here's two instances where they're going to take it from. Now, you mentioned other things. Uh, roughly, Mr. President, those other things that you mentioned, the $16 million for, uh, what was it, library, roughly off the top of your head, what are we looking at? Yes. Well, the library was 12. 12. That's yeah. just okay. an estimate. Okay. There's a $6 million open space bond. That's 18. And then there's a $1 million school 18, maintenance 19. construction bond right there. 
and the, with, with interest, that's roughly uh, $24,000, 24, $24 million. All right, 20, $24 million. On top look, of the outstanding debt that we have, which is at $26.1 million. All right, so you're looking at one, one, another third of what the proposal is today. So you can add, you can add a third to that 250 and add a third to the five, to the five, uh, to the five, uh, yeah, the 560 for businesses. Well, we're already paying on the outstanding debt, so you can't add that. It, it, well, That's already it, built in. I noticed what I'm saying, but the school needs the school needs the new school, needs the school this need. The school needs. They just ran three hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars deficit. Wait, 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 wait. You know what I'm saying? They have a lousy track. In 2007, we were talking the, the core committee. We we're talking about. Uh, I think the school, we got a, uh, a proposal of $123 million. And it was said to me by then, a former school committee person, that if we get a new school, we're all set for 40 years. 40 years. You got builders in Newport, over 220 years old. How come when the government builds something, it only lasts 40 years? This is the, you know, when you have bottomless pit, and you can go into other people's pockets to get what you want. Maybe you're not so thoughtful about spending. You know, let's walk before we run. You've got shelves that are empty. The dollar store, you go in there, you buy 10 items, which cost you $10. Now it costs you just $12.50. They just went up 25 cents. And they're not the only one. Inflation, 7%. If we were living in a, a, a situation a year and a half ago, maybe, when you're paying a dollar, a dollar eighty for for gas instead of three fifty. How about the person that's going to go to work? How about I work construction. Sometimes I had to drive eighty miles to bring home money to pay to, to to put food on my family's table. How about that guy? How much is he paying for gas to go to work and pay his taxes? I know where you're coming from, Mr. President, and I agree with you. There's things that's got, that's got to be done, but this is, this is, I don't think this is the time to do it because everybody's hurting. A 400, somebody's house, $400,000, it's going to cost them two fifty, dollars and then with other things, it could wind up being uh, three seventy-five. dollars and if they're on fixed income, where are you going to get? Social Security, most people got a $76 raise, that's gone. That's going to fill up your tax, your, 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 your gas once, once a week. And I want that, that money's gone. So please, let's, let's, let's be a little, tighten up our belts and, 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 and move a little slower. I understand, I, was, I remember, I understand when Mr. Brown came here, uh, the town was living from week to week. Now the town's in pretty good shape. We, we, always, we always need more, you have to keep things up. But I would say, uh, let's walk before we run. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Viveris. Okay. Anybody else want to come? Mr. Walsh, sorry. <clears throat> May. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Been quite the ride. Um, one of the things I can say to Sean's point, and I understand that, Council changes every two years. I don't know if that's true in Middletown. Maybe we can just all agree to stay until the bonds paid off, right? Then we can, that'll be that. So that's easy. And I don't think that's a stretch, actually. And uh, so to point to Mrs. Von Villas, uh, who, as a number of us in this room had for a teacher, said, you never know until you try. So. I'm listening to everybody. I'm trying to decide, okay, who's going to, should I even make this motion or not? It sounds like everybody's going downhill, but hey, we gained a little momentum. So I'm going to make a motion to approve the conceptual design and cost estimates, which will allow the committee to further their designs to keep their schedule for a bond referendum and ride phase two applications. Okay. And if I had music to play, I would play it in the background. <laughs> All right. We have a second. Second. Yes. We have a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve, and you're talking about option E. 
Option E, the okay. best option. Yes. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Opposed. I oppose. Okay. How is it? Wendy, what is it? She said she approved. She said aye. Okay. She was in favor. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay, so again. Can I just ask a question now so that we can have this clarification? So now that this is, that you have voted. Name and address for the record, please. Grace Spangler, Thank 132 you. Have Peckham to, Lane, you School Committee else. Chair. Um, so now that you voted this down, I have to ask, what, what happens now? What is the next, next step? You need, or, you need or to address the council, Teresa. It, well, I would like them to be able to answer that for they you. They can so hear if, you. If this, now that you voted it down, what is the next step to happen, or is this just become a dead issue and we're done? Well, I, I can't answer for everybody. For me, it's not a dead issue. I'd like to see it, 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 what Chris proposed. I'd oh, like to see something else. I don't know, though, what, I mean, what, I don't know what RIDE's requirements are, so I don't know. That's why I would like them, if they could just give us some guidance of what happens. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Von Billis, please. If I were in your shoes, the committee, I would go back and I would look at that list that's on the $90, $90 million list and I would identify what you absolutely have to have and reduce the total, okay? Because you know already what your needs are, all right? So you're not going to get them all, apparently, because of the vote. So go back and identify what are the basic needs and cut it, cut it so that it'll pass. So That's what I would do. As Doug asked the question, what, what is, is the number? target number then? Right. So don't tell us to go back and do all that work, pay all the money for architectural services, come back with 75 million and you guys say, oh no, that's still too much, go back to the drawing board. So why don't you give a target guesstimate rather than playing this shell game because it's too much, too much work and money right. going into that. I don't Can I respond to that? Yeah. I would like to respond to that. I'm just curious of what the guesstimate was. That you, guessed. What you were thinking about. There will be no guesstimate. I want to understand what the tax rate's going to be in three months when we go through the budget. Because it's not going to be $12.02. It's not even going to be close to that. So now we're going to add 7% on top of whatever that new tax rate is for the resident. I want to understand what's going to hit the taxpayer's pocket. Because if you put $90 million on the ballot today, Heaven forbid it will pass because no bond ever gets voted down in the state of Rhode Island. I sure as shit wouldn't vote for it if I showed up. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. Wow. Sorry. But we don't know what we're working with this year. And to guesstimate the numbers based upon what we've gone through up to this point is fine and well. The sad reality is, is that we're already starting in a hole for this budget season. We're already starting in a hole. Well, and all we're going to do is dig it a little bit deeper if we just continue to move forward without understanding this fact. I understand that, but I also think that we're digging a lot deeper into our children's educational and I, system. Teresa, and I, I it don't, concerns I don't me disagree. a great deal. I don't disagree with you that deal. something needs to happen with the schools. I still have children there who will be do, there through construction. But you one, can't hey, just listen, do, one at a time, Teresa. You can't just do a little bit and do it halfway. And that is the point about this whole thing. As Doug had said, if we're going to have portable... Uh, um, classrooms outside and, and move students out to do the mass construction, I, you don't just want to do it halfway because then you're only going to spend that money once. Listen, I, I, under, I, res, I respect Doug. Doug doesn't pay taxes here. And we look out for our tax. I, I know you do, and so do I. Twice. And that's our two, job. But I pay two times. Good for you. So, so no, good, no good for me. I work very hard I, to pay my taxes. And I'm just taxes. saying, good for you. And it's hard work. Exactly, but, but we're not talking about you or I. We're talking about the majority of the people in Middletown. I understand that. That's what we're doing. I understand that. Mr. Welch. So, based on that last bit of conversation, I would have said exactly what Teresa said. It, it, this is a ridiculous exercise if you don't have a number. And if you can't give a number or you want to wait for the tax rate to hit the page, then you might as well say, everybody go on vacation for three months because we can't tell you anything. I would suggest you reduce it by a third. But you don't know the tax rate. Nobody's going to bite. You don't know what the tax rate is. So what are you saying to the committee? Pretty much you're saying... I'm saying I don't make decisions based upon I don't knows. Okay. You don't do that at your house. I don't do it at my house. We don't do it here in town. We've never done that. 
And that's why the town was in trouble in 1998, because they just kept spending and borrowing, had no vision for the future. Not our we've, made, we've made decisions, and we made sound financial decisions, and we're going to continue to make sound financial decisions. And we're not on, I'm not sure. I'm, if somebody else wants to do that, fine. I'm not doing that. It's so, that simple. So, does, and it's not going to force me from a timeline to go, it has to be on this referendum. We're making, going to make the best decisions for the town with facts. Just like you said and Terry said earlier, with facts. We don't have all the facts. Never going to. And so all I'm asking for you is for that group of people right there, and there's three times as many as that that show up at the meeting, are we disbanded until the tax rate comes out? Because there's nothing else we can do. I'm just telling you how I feel. If the council wants to do something different, I'm one person. Does anybody have an idea what the committee should do? Because right now you we want have to throw nothing a number. To I don't know what their what their absolute number is as far as our absolute need. I don't know what that number is. That is a relative term. Your absolute need. That is not. It, okay. is, it is not. You do walk you know in and it say is? that light bulb's out and that one's on. It's not that way. No, everything is intermixed. So I'm trying to say to you, you can't okay. just pick it apart like that. Well, I'm picking it apart because yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a decision you based can, on a You can number. reduce it by a percentage and then, then take a look at what, what has been identified as the needs and see what you can do if you, with the percentage that you end up with. Okay. Okay. We're I can't go off the top of my head and say what, what those needs cost. I can't either. That's but, what I'm saying. But, but what you're saying is do nothing. And what they're asking for I'm, is some guidance. So my suggestion yeah. is we don't like 90. We don't like the impact that it has on the, on the tax rate that's been shown. Okay. Pro projected. All right. So. I don't think it's fair to ask them to reduce it by 50 or 30 percent or, 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 or more than that. Reduce it by 30 so that if it's at 90 million now, get it down to 60 and let's see what you can do. I don't know. Give them a target. Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the um, committee or the architects, the folks that are, are accustomed to the procedure and whatnot, if they um, could, without a definitive direction today, do they, because that was my understanding, they needed a definitive direction with a number today to make the timelines for everything else going forward, <laughs> ride and whatnot up to the, to the ballot. So if we, if we don't have that number today, that tells me that, that it's over. And I just want to confirm that with them. It's over. Um, I mean, let's, let's, we've identified the need. I think we can all agree on that, right? We've all been through the schools. We, we know what the schools need. It, it, this right. comes down to we need to give direction to our architects. You know, I don't know what to tell you. It, we've gone through every option. We've scaled back every option, and we still stand here today in front of you, community members, and think this is the absolute best option for our schools and for our town. Now, we've, we've gone back and forth. If you want to give us a number back, we can work on that. I don't know what's going it's, it's The problem's still going to be there. That need is never going away until we address it all. We can address it all. We understand that. But the need's not going away. And it's just going to get costlier and costlier. Yep. Yep. So, so, so the answer to the question then, Charlie, is that is yes or no, because I'm talking about the process going forward and having the need for a definitive number tonight. Well, the I think the, the main driver to that, I thought bond council had to start in March, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's what we are going by. And, and one of the reasons why we didn't want the bond as a special vote was because you don't get voter turnout for those. It's consistently across the state. The most voter turnout you get is during a regular election, which is we want to get as much of the input from the town. We don't want to just put this out. This just isn't us in a room deciding this. We've, we've gone out to the community, had visioning sessions. We had one of the best responses to surveys the town's ever seen, according to your communications director. And I, I think, you know, We've done that, we've done that work, and we wanna put it out at a time where most of the voters show up. 
not at a special election. So that, what was the driving factor in the timeline, we, we took some heat off by not doing a phase two in February, right? So we now can do that in September. But the, the bond council has to start looking at this in March in order to put it to the state in May, correct? So that, that's the driving factor tonight. We, we need to know the number. And, and, and of course, the conversation at the dais has been that they, the knowledge of the tax rate needs to be um, in place before you're going to get that kind of a nod. And that's not going to happen until May. So, I, so if, if we're done, what I guess to back to um, Teresa's question, is this where we say, okay, the bond failed and we're going to do some capital work to, of what is absolutely necessary and, and get something done on the schools? Are we at that day? That for me? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, because if you recall, the, the one of the questions was, if the bond failed, what's the what do you do? Well, you have a, a an action plan that you execute and you get some important things done with capital. So are we there? That's the question. It, it, it sounds like we are. Holly Demers, Colliers. I can't I, hear you, Holly. Holly Demers from Colliers, the OPM. I have a question. Uh, you had mentioned giving us a number at 60, $60 million. If they went back and looked and see where the priorities are based on what um, we're hearing tonight, are you still, uh, will you still have to wait till, the, till May to understand the tax rate if we do that? Because that's really the driving force here. The 60 million coming up with a scope and, and getting the green light on that, without the, the architect has to do so much work. There's probably 60 exhibits outside of the plans that have to come together. It's a huge endeavor, it really is. We typically would have already started. But if you're saying 90's off the table and, and you had mentioned perhaps reducing it by 30% and the team could come up with whatever that is that would address your capital needs while still maximizing as many bonus points because that's the timing of this. It's critical for you to get access to the bonus points. That timeline we could, I, you know, I shouldn't speak for the team, but expedite, but we can't wait until you figure out your, your tax base because that's really, we should be a third or halfway through the process by May. We can't possibly start that and be able to deliver anything to the state in May from a September. So I guess that's the question. Is the, if it's $60 million that you'd like us to look at and really break down the need and try to capitalize on the bonus points and we can get a green light, that's part. If, but if you're saying yes, but we still can't let you know until March or May, then it's a problem. Good question. What do you mean? I think that's a great question. I'm going to talk. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. Um, just to further that point a little bit, uh, you're, um, it's such an important decision. Completely understand wanting to know all of the facts at hand. I think one of them that should be considered is the cost. The, the implications of delaying this, if we can't make a decision to get this package in uh, within the cycle that we've described here, um, and really, and the schedule of that is being driven by having to get in front of the General Assembly to authorize the bond, you'll have to wait till the next time they're in sec session, right? So you basically would lose a year in this process. and that will be an expensive year, I'll just argue with the trends that are happening right now. The problems aren't going away, um, and, and back to the point about prioritizing the work. We can prioritize the identified capital needs to any number you tell us. You know, they, they, you can look at any list and say, what is the most important thing? Of course, 
um, you can do that, and we will do that. If that's what we're asked to do, that's what we'll do. But I also think an equally important part of that exercise is, is to help you figure out the most cost-effective way of, of, of doing what's not included on that list. And, and so that's why we've always kind of pushed this comprehensive view at the total problem, understanding the burden on the taxpayers. But our objective is to find, you know, under, if we all agree on the challenges, what's the most cost-effective way to address them? And that's what we're trying to propose here. Whether it's doable or not is not up for us to say. It's obviously it's a town decision. But if you recognize the needs and you recognize the cost of waiting, which unfortunately there is one, uh, then settling on a number that is manageable and then having us help you prior or asking us to prioritize the work to uh, respond to that number seems to me to be the prudent path forward. Sean, any idea what 60 would look like on the tax rate? A third of what it is. Oh. <clears throat> Just give us a minute. Yeah. To... Dennis, you, Dennis yeah, go I ahead. I did have a question on that. So, going back to... Um, Again, part of this was right from the start, we had a whole list of that were being asked, like $160 million worth of stuff was being asked for. And we're like, there's no way that's going to happen. We can't afford that. You know, we passed a $10 million bond to improve our schools, and that was a, a pretty detailed list. I wasn't up here when it happened, but what I was told was those are the things that are going to enable us to keep our schools open, which I've heard is, is what happened. We haven't even finished spending that bond. We're close. I just saw something that was like 1.2 million that's going to be a washout. So maybe the work's been done on the financials there, the, one of the bonds. The bond's done. Yeah, okay. So the bonds, just, okay, well, it's relatively new, newly done, right? Within the year? Yeah, it's been. In, there was still there was still money outstanding in the last yeah. budget. So, and that's yeah, not so my point. Last, my, yeah. my, and so, we're looking at a lot of money to do a lot of things. And and it's I'm hearing that we're exhausting our resources. We're going to have to really, you know, tighten the belt. And and we're not sure what is coming down the road. So that's part of it. And I was trying to get to the list that we had asked for originally that said. If you had a million dollars, what would you do? What would be the highest priority? And work your way down the ladder and say, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. Because, as I said, to sell a $90 million bond to the taxpayer is going to be a lot of work. And there's going to be a lot of questions to that. And I don't know if that appetite is there. People I've talked to are like, are you, that would be the largest bond we've ever packed. Granted, I see what's happening in Newport. I see that that whole new school going on. That's just the high school. And I think, you know, that thing keeps ebbing and flowing. I'm afraid that might happen. So I would like to see more of a nailed down priority list of what are the infrastructure needs to foundation that we can grow on. That's what I'd like to see. And I'd like you to tell me what that is. You know, we talked about moving the teachers, uh, the, excuse me, the town administration into the new school and building a lot of new work areas. To me, could we relocate them to a different school, to another building that the, the town owns or another facility? I don't know. Those are, that's what I was hoping that we would actually be able to maybe even get in the next phase. But what I heard was 90's the number. We're, and tell us, you know, and that's what we're going to go for. And I, I just have a hard time with all the unknowns to, um, in the times that we're in, to, to authorize $90 million. I got one thing. Okay. So I probably should have asked this before we motion was made and put to a vote. If we had said yes, move forward. Come May, we find out that the tax rate is going to go up a dollar fifty for residential rate. Could I stop it then? Could I have stopped this process? 
Yeah. Well, listen, listen, we don't operate like this. If you're going to speak, you come up to the podium, please. And I ask this because I just can't just putting this forward to the taxpayer without something hard line. We move it forward and we realize that there's a huge, significant gap in what's budgeted and needed for the town. And then we also have this lingering, something has to give. I know we have to do something in our schools. We need to do something in those schools back in the 90s when I was there. I know we need to do that. It was in the 80s. I got that. But I know we need to do something. Understood. And we go to bond, and all of a sudden nothing happens. We're on the hook for 60 million still, if I heard that correctly, right? Half. Application wise? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's not. So you could go through this stage, like have the, you know, your team put this stage two together. And at any point, you as the town can tell us that you're not going to go to bond and you want to cancel. You can, we can go to ride and you can, if you don't want to go to bond, you don't have to go to bond. Um, the thing is, is to go to ride, you have to go to bond for whatever it is we're asking. So say in May, you find that the tax rate is going to skyrocket higher than you're comfortable. If you wanted to take it from 90 to 60 at that point or whatever that number would be, I don't know what that means from a design perspective because at that point they're pretty in, right, committed. Right. But as far as you at any point wanting to pull the plug, of course you can. Um, there's all that, there was a conversation regarding the bonus points as well as to what would happen if in fact you find out that the bonus point won't be extended. You know, what does that mean as far as the scope? And all of those things can be dealt with as they come. But in order for us to be successful for the town of Middletown, we have to start now. We just don't have the ability. It's just so much work to get a successful application in. You know, if, again, if you said 60 million, we would focus on that. But again, that's a lot of time because, as you've seen, we're already on option E. So, um, and, and to not really take advantage of the bonus points would be a shame. You know, we had, uh, Doug had mentioned perhaps if this fell apart and we didn't get it to, to the state in time for them to review to go to the General Assembly, if this resolution is successful and the bonus points are extended, which we anticipate happening, all of that is for nothing because you lost a year and now you'd be back right where we are right now, right? So it's to give us, the, I mean, we contractually are stage, we're doing a stage two. So nothing would change. We would just continue down the road we're on and then you could keep, ex we would come and present whenever you'd like. And if at some point you find that that rate is not, you're not comfortable with, then we reevaluate. But I, if you say no now, then it really hinders the whole process of success. I don't disagree. I don't. I know the work that's gone into it. I'm nauseous over this topic. I'm sure. I lost sleep this weekend. I shouldn't lose sleep over something that I know is the right thing to do. But I know on the flip side of the coin, there's somebody that's going to suffer. We're going to do something for the kids. We're going to make the buildings great, but somebody else is going to suffer. So to sit up here and say, well, which side has to suffer for this? It's not an easy decision. Is there a number? I, you know, the, the chair I just, just. John, do we have a. a... <coughs> so. That would increase the tax rate from 1202 to 1260 or 58%, which is 4.8%. Which is, I didn't hear. Well, what was that that's, figure? That's again? at 60, but that's, what about, what would the town actually, we borrow 60, mm -hmm. but what would, at 35%, what's it? Uh, $18,000? We, we simply took the schedule, we took 60% of the schedule that we calculated before. Okay. Okay. Yep, assuming the same 45% reimbursement level. Okay. And that will be, you know, that's tied to the ability to get the bonus points, right? So as soon as you take it from 90 to 60, we'd have to really evaluate each project. And, and I understand that, but we're just trying to make it affordable for our residents. Absolutely. And we're trying to balance something here. So Mr. bonus points to me are important because they're dollars, but what's most important is affordability. Absolutely. So, Understood. In time, I get it. On your end, on my, our end, 
On my end, it's a little, maybe a little different. I got you. Mr. Viveros. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, when we borrowed $10 million for the school, how much interest over the 20 years are we paying? I thought it was like six. I want to say it's five, but. Okay, five. So we bought, now we go 90, so it's nine, it's five times six. Add that to the 90 for the cost of 20 years. I'm, I'm not sure it's the same rate. And you're just throwing numbers out there, so. No, I'm, 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 we get a pretty good rate before. Now, now things are going up. Inflation's hitting. So even if it was the same rate, it's nine times that. It's and then you got, you got everything else. You know, the school department says we need X number of dollars to do. And you say, well, okay, what do you need it for? Well, we need it. What do you need it for? Give me a list. You said it before. Give me a list. You don't get the list. It's giving the money and we'll spend, we'll, we'll find some, we'll, we'll do what we have to do with it. Okay. I like uh, Council Von Villas. Give us a list, go back, look at, you got 90. What's the most important things that you, you do? What's the most important thing a father does? Puts food on his family table. May have to wait to buy that new car. Most important thing is to put food on the table and feed his family. They don't do that. When things are bad, they don't do that. The council level funds them, yet the administrators get a bonus. Hello? Okay, let's get back to... Let's, 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 let's get a list we need most important. The most important things first. Now, the council took a vote, and it was four to three. Still talking about it. Debate. They were up here debating you. Why are you, why are you debating him? Go. That's it. Antone, this is part of the process. Why do we let you up a second and third time? Because we listen. I know that, we listen. That's why, I, I, that's why we do that respectfully. I, I, know, I know we listen. Whether we agree, respectfully disagree, we listen. Right. If it takes a little longer, we listen. No matter whether we like I, what somebody's I, saying or they like, don't like what I'm saying or the <laughs> council, that's okay. We listen. Okay? But let's, let's get, get a list together of the most important, important things. I and agree. Think, and you got to think of the taxpayers. Mr. Crimmins. Yes, sir. You need to come up and state your name and address for the record. Please. Uh, my name is John Crimmins. I live at 108 Riverview Avenue in Middletown. Um, I was here for a different reason, but I got here a little bit early and sort of got into the middle of this whole thing. But the way I look at the whole thing with school committees is like, they got 64% of your budget already, right? When I was working at the Newport County YMCA, as a, I was a head of the uh, facilities committee, we accounted for everything. Um, we depreciated all of our assets, right? So like, it was a burner in the basement of the building or the roof that had to be replaced or any mechanical thing that had to be replaced. It was all on a depreciated scale. And we replaced those things that they needed to be done. So you didn't have to come up with this big, huge bill, you know, at the end of 10 years. Now, I remember Quinnick School being redone, I don't know, it's gotta be 10, 15 years ago? 1994, John. Okay, well, that's been a long time, but, yep. you know, it, I just see this money sort of being funneled into a big hole, and then, then $96 million is a lot of money, guys. You know what I mean? Just think about it for a minute. And then these people come up and keep on negotiating and negotiating and negotiating like you've already said no to them, and they want to drop it to $60 million. You know, whatever you want, whatever you need. You know, it's like, and then it's going to end up being more in anyways. You know, I just think that you've got to hold the school committee and the school department accountable for their spending overall, it, it, you know, whether it's for capital improvements, whether it's what they, you know, do with their staff or whatever. I don't, you know, like I'm not privy to all that information and I don't know if that gets to you guys, but as far as I'm concerned, it's like school spending's out of control. And then <laughs> you, you get the student population that's actually decreasing over time and they want to put all this money into buildings, you know? It's like, <laughs> we've been trying to get, <laughs> you know, the town to look at the, you know, the, 
the boat ramp at Third Beach for like 20 years, you know what I mean? To see what we can do to like, you know, fix it, you know, or, or, or not new, necessarily build a new building at Second Beach, but like actually try to fix it up a little bit and, you know, so it can accommodate more people and be 21st century, you know? And then I hear this type of money being spent and I, you know, I see the pie charts on all of the school committees all of the state of Rhode Island is like 64% of the budget, 65% of the budget. I mean, like, where does it go from here? You know, you got to have accountability. You know what I mean? So, that's it. Okay, John. Thank you, sir. Um, Mrs. Flynn's next. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just, I wanted to clarify for uh, Mr. Viveros the outflow of that 90 million. Of the 90 million, uh, there would be reimbursements that would have the town responsible or spending, investing in the schools, I believe of 49 million. With the debt service, it would be a total of 66 million out of pocket over the, I think it's a 20 year bond. Um, so it's not a, you know, a straight 10, nine times 10 million. It, it is a little bit different. So the, the there's, I see two options here right now because our guests are not wrong. The vote has been taken and we we need to move on so that we either say, okay, we've taken the vote, everybody go home, we're done because we're not gonna make the time frame uh, and, and the submission to ride with these professionals. Or we say something, since we can't determine a, a, a number because we have unknowns, that if the vote did get one one more vote, if the motion got one more vote, we'd be going forward with a, a 90 million. And if the vote, the ballot vote for the taxpayers failed, we would be committed to half of that, 45 million. We all know something needs to no, be done. You'd be committed to zero if it fails. Right. Zero. I don't think that's true. That is true. Is that true, team? Team Charlie. All right, Terry, I think I've been through enough bonds. When they fail, you're not obligated to anything. Okay. Nothing, zero, it means it did not pass. Oh, I'm sorry, that is correct. If it passes, you at least have to spend 50%. I'm sorry, it's 10 o'clock and we're running past our three and a half hours um, per the council rules. <laughs> so yes, so, so let's say it did pass. All you'd be committed uh, and you at least have to spend half of it. Oh, no. Is that a, a number that this council would discuss moving forward with? What do you what did you just say, Terry? I, I said yes, if if the bond, if the $90 million bond passed and we decided we didn't want to do 90 million, say in May, you know, we got that that high tax uh, mill rate and things were happening. And we said, you know what, we're not going to spend that, but we are obligated to spend half of it. So my question to the council to move this along is, is that a number that you would be comfortable with so we can get some submission to, to ride that we would follow through on? Or do you want to just call it a night and move on to item 15? Uh, what's the pleasure of the council? Because we need to move on one way move or another. Take a vote. Dennis, <laughs> Chris. Could you support 60? I'd be willing to support this as long as we're willing to kick the tires off in May when we figure out what that tax I'm good with that. Be. Yeah. I refuse to move forward if we're going to pass a huge burden onto our taxpayers. And it's not going to be what's written in this document right now. It is not. But I will have more time to think about it, to chew on it, and then reassess where we go from there. Again, I, I think this timeline is incredibly incredibly accelerated and I know we have things that we have to meet and you guys have done a, a novel job of getting it all done but we're accelerating a big decision in only a few months time but if they come back with 90 and you they don't like it then you're still gonna vote against it but my hope is that they would think about as they're going forward to tear this into different things like I said when I first started I wish there was a plan for 45 I wish there was a plan for 60 I wish there was a plan for 75. I know you're not going to do all that work, but I would like to see those works be done. Could I ask a question of the team? Um, yes, ma'am. 
I think Holly, you might have the answer to this question. If if the pleasure of the council is to at least, as you point out, to get some submission to ride so that we don't totally miss the process if we decide that we would like to take advantage of the, the, the process and the end result of, of moving forward with a project, would it be your recommendation that the work is already done for the 90 million, that we go forward with that those plans or that we simply cut it way down to something that we're we're probably going going to be more comfortable with i think you should i mean i would guess you want to talk i want go to right talk. ahead your name and address please Hi, <laughs> holly DeMarson. we just holly we just can't walk up and stop blurting things out we have to follow the procedure yep. understood okay i just want to because it can get out of control real quick okay all right holly demers colliers um We've had this conversation with the committee in hoping that we had a number that we could work toward, and that's really what we need. I don't think you should go forward with 90 if you can't get your head around it and, and don't want to support it. It would, if, it, if the number is 60, then that, that will be the number, and we will prioritize whatever the district needs. But that, we do need a number. Okay. Mr. Welch. So I just want to be clear. I want to move forward with something. I don't want to walk away here with nothing, obviously. But I think everybody needs to understand that I keep hearing the same question over and over. Bring us back a list of the priorities. What you don't understand is it's not that simple. Not only is it you're in the chase under the hallway of the high school and you're replacing the leaking plumbing pipes that are next to the water pipes, and what are you going to do? replace one and not do the other. You're going to breach a wall where you could fix the tile as you go through, but you're not going to because it, it, everything is intermixed. So just be ready so that when the list comes back of things, it's going to be like, ah, oh, that's all we're getting? We're getting all this for 90. Now we're only getting this for 60. It's because the, everything's intertwined, not only from a mechanical standpoint, but also from the points. So once you back this project down and you lose that ability, if you remember Ed showing the moving piece by moving the um, media center into the, I'll just use that example because that's what really struck me was you add that piece into the courtyard, it allows everything else to move around. Now you back down on the number and that's no longer possible, it falls apart. So you, you're going to end up with a less bang for your buck. I like your idea, Chris. I understand your concern. Um, so how about the same idea? Wheels come off, we cut it loose, but we do 90 instead of 60. Second. Yeah, no motion. That, that, wasn't, motion. that wasn't yeah, a motion. No, that was just a question. Come on. OK, let's go. We need to move this. Um, either we're going to move it or we're going to move on. Well, I would like to put the motion out for, for 60, Go okay? I, I don't know the language of the motion, but let's just try it. If, if they don't like it, they'll turn it down. Okay, I'll second. Is there any further discussion? 60 gets it working. It gets it moving. It gets, gives them information so they know what to make fit. Okay, Mrs. Santos. Okay, if we go to 60... If we go to 60, thank you, Mr. President. If we go to 60, are we going to receive an updated list yes. of what's going to be done? Because I heard something tonight that I had not heard before, which I'm going to go home and check that list and see if it's on there, because I do not believe it was on there. So what? Yes. That you're going to have to put, once the project gets working on, you're going to have to put the students outside. Have you made a list of where you're going to put the students and what you're going to put them in? Yes. It's in, in what? All right, can I, can I? Just one at a time, please. Yeah. One at a time. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. I, I think maybe, you know, we've put lots of lists together and we, we've gone through that. And yes, we did list that out. And it's a portable? 
Yeah, yeah we may we may have to do portable classrooms, correct. That's what we've put it into the budget. I must have missed it. I apologize. Oh, that's all right. Please accept my apology. No problem. Thank right. you. That was around three million. Okay. Mrs. Bonvillis, we have a motion and a second for sixty. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Opposed. I oppose too. Okay, passes. We'll see you soon. Sixty. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, Beach. Good number 15, Memorandum of Charlene A. Rose Cirillo, Chairman, Middletown Beach Commission, in reference to address Town Council, January 18, 2022, regarding boat ramp safety and functionality of the, and the pavilion methodology and expanding and improving safety and liability and meeting the needs of lifeguards, beach staff, and office staff. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Charlene's online. Okay. The president, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Doing? Uh, uh, not too good. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> so I, I'm just getting down from COVID. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to refer to my vice chairman, Bill Seipel, and some of my committee members are here. So Bill will be speaking on for me. So Bill can come okay. before. Thank you. Thank I'll, you I'll, I'll, I'm, my voice is going. No problem. You feel better, Charlene. Thank Hope you. you feel better, yeah. Thanks. Joe's got it too. Good uh, evening, Mr. Seipel. Good evening. Bill Seipel, 27 White Terrace, Middletown, vice chairman, Beach Commission. Um, and, you know, all that other stuff. I, in all seriousness, I, I almost feel disrespectful coming before you after that very heated and, and, and really meaningful discussion. I mean, that's a huge, huge thing you guys are, are trying to deal with, and I, and I respect that. And it almost might seem that, well, here these guys are coming before us asking about a a boat ramp and a beach building when we're struggling with, with the school system, and obviously the school system is a huge priority. So with that in mind, though, I, I would I'd just like to say that we're talking about a lot of the same things in the sense that we as a beach commission need to know uh, if there's any interest in moving forward out in certain kinds of projects, and if so, how do we come up with, with, a, with a number to make that happen? Now, unlike the school department, we do have a revenue source other than the town. We do have money set aside already uh, that, we, that you guys voted on a number of years ago to put aside X amount of bucks for every, every um, daily pass that's sold. So we have that money. We have grant money that we can pursue and things like that. So, so we really don't know a dollar number. We're not here to say, you guys got to give us X amount of bucks. We're really here to say, listen, we think there's a couple problems that need addressing. What's the best way to address those problems? And the first one I'll talk about is the ramp. Now, I believe that you have a document uh, in front of you that, that talks about the ramp. And that, and that came from, that was our, our last formal attempt to deal with the ramp. But just let me roll the clock back a little bit. Um, the, the idea of the ramp needing work goes, goes way back. When I was a boat owner back in the 80s, uh, I realized after my first trip at low tide that it was not possible for me to use the ramp at low tide. I struggled to get my boat out, and I finally did, and that was the last time I tried that. Since, since that time, I, many, many people get stuck on the ramp. It's, it happens today, it happens all the time. Now, when I finally became beach manager in the early 2000s, uh, the, where we were at was that ramp was still a problem. So Tom O'Loughlin was the, uh, was the, was the, was the um, what do you call him? Public Works Director. Public Works Director. Sorry, you know, <laughs> no it's late. I don't, it's, I'm a retired guy. We don't stay up that late. Like Teresa, I don't, you know, we don't stay up that late, right, Teresa? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So at any rate, he would send us guys down with a backhoe to dig the ramp out at low tide. They'd pick a, lo a low tide, a moon low tide dig the ramp out to try to make it usable and go from there. And that happened for many, many years. And that was, a, that was the solution to the ramp issue. 
But the problem with that was, and that's why it stopped, was that as the ramp filled back in, which it always does, the sand was soft. And the more you did it, the softer the sand got, the worse it got. So they finally figured out it was a waste of time. So what we did, going back to um, 2006, we, we realized it was a problem. I was a manager at that time. And we had to try to come up with a solution that everybody could live with. So we developed a whole plan. It took us three years. We, had, we dealt with the CRMC, DEM, Norman Bird Sanctuary, Fish and Wildlife, and anybody else we could think of. And so we were going to move the ramp, or try to move the ramp down to where the town beach was. Now at the time, you couldn't swim there, because that kept getting closed. So that was, seemed like a good idea. It's an area that we didn't want people swimming. We didn't put a lifeguard there. And so we made that proposal. Unfortunately, the plovers moved in, and that was the end of that deal. So that plan was out the window. And then in, in 2009, Warren Hall drew up a plan and submitted it to CRMC to improve and extend the existing ramp. Now, I don't know what happened to that plan. I have, I have the plan, but it didn't go anywhere. So in 2009, out the window. In 2010, Warren Hall drew up another plan. And that, that had an improved boat ramp. It had a handicap ramp and a pier. And we came before the council. We had a meeting. That was, uh, that was a rugged meeting. And that didn't go anywhere. So then we developed the plan that you have in, in front of you there. That was in 2010 after the other one failed. And we said, you know, Warren, I sat down with Warren and Tom, and we tried to figure out, well, what could we possibly do? And so that plan, and I'm not saying that's what we want to do. All I'm saying is that was the last best effort we had, and it was the cheapest way we, we could figure out to improve the ramp. And what Warren had figured out was that the way they build ramps now is different than that other ramp, um, which is all cement. Some people say there's cars buried underneath there to make it, uh, give it some, some depth. <laughs> Um, we don't know that, and we wouldn't know that until we actually tried something. But at any rate, he said, well, there's a way to build a ramp where you don't have to build a coffer dam and do all that other stuff. So that plan that you have there was the last best effort we had in 2010. In 2012, we did an informal plan, and again, that didn't make it anywhere. It, it didn't pass muster from whomever said, you can't do it, so forget about it. So we have submitted, or tried to submit over the years, numerous plans to deal with the ramp. And then in 2020, Warren Hall came up with another plan to maybe add a floating dock to see if we could at least make some improvements at the ramp. And that didn't make, make it anywhere. So what we're really asking here about the ramp is, listen, there's a problem. The ramp has had a problem for a long, long time. It just doesn't work right at low tide. It's the only ramp on this side, on the east side of the island. Uh, it's to me, and that's all in that paper. I don't want to go through it all. But there's some issues there. And we just got to know, can we try to figure out how to solve that problem? That's really what we're asking. Can we move forward somehow to come up with a, a definitive plan that says, listen, much like you just asked the school committee, listen, what, what is it that you would, that you would live with <laughs> and then let us try to figure out, through Warren and whoever else, what it would cost to make that happen. And like I said, we do have some money. There are some grants available. So that's what we're asking for the ramp. Just is it something that you would consider letting us or you know, having Sean or whomever move forward, Warren, move forward to try to figure out how to get that ramp to be a workable ramp? That's the ramp issue. The building issue is, is similar in the sense that in 2007, we hired Newport Collaborative to come up with a plan. They studied the beach. They went through all that stuff. They did focus groups, through all that other stuff. And they come up with some really whack job plan that we said, you got to be kidding. And we, and we got rid of it. Um, but what they did was that they identified a bunch of needs. In 2011, we hired RKG Associates to do the same thing. And they went through the whole process. And they gave us a wonderful presentation and all that stuff. And they had a couple different buildings and things like that. And we shot that down. We said, nah, that's too much. We're not spending that kind of money. And then in 2014, you developed the, uh, the Beach Facility Advisory Committee. And they went through it. They reviewed the other two. They come to their own conclusions. And they said, listen, no, we don't need a new building. And, and that's too costly. But there are needs. 
There are, there are definable needs, and they're all listed in that report that you have. But, you know, we have many more lifeguards than we used to have, and we have as many females as males, and yet they're trying to share the same areas. And we try to Band-Aid down there. You guys, you know, allowed us to Band-Aid down there to try to make that accommodation, but realistically, it's a tough thing. It, you know, and we have to rob Peter to pay Paul. We have no place for staff. We keep trying to come up with places for staff to be where they don't sit out there and, and get in trouble and have people look at them and say, what are all these guys doing sitting around? And we don't have a work area. We're using trailers all over the place. So all we're really saying there, it's the same kind of thing there, is is it feasible to try to move forward? And I would use that, the 2014 plan that they came up with as a building block to say, can we, can we move forward on this and try to figure out if there's a way to come up with a plan, a definable plan, much like you were talking about with the schools, a definable plan that we look at and say, listen, here's the needs, we know the needs, they've been identified with three different studies. How do, we, how do we address those needs? We don't want a new building. Uh, we're looking to see, we know we can add on to that building. <clears throat> we know we can go up on that building. We've already done some investigation. You can put a second floor on it. Uh, and house the lifeguards up there, and that you don't have to worry about being uh, ADA compliant because your lifeguards have a different set of uh, expectations of them. So you could go up and you could put your lifeguards up there and, and that would accommodate that. So we know there's things you could do. We just need to have some, some guidance as to whether or not it's something we, we can move forward to or do we just let it die. Okay, Sean. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to comment on was the boat ramp and Mr. Seipel obviously detailed uh, all of the different boat ramps we've looked at and there's been a lot but talking to Warren this morning and and having been through this the issue isn't the issue down there is the profile of the beach itself um, you can build a ramp but as everybody recalls the problem at low tide is to get enough draft to launch a boat the boat ramp itself had to go about 100 feet out into the water because it pancakes at the bottom. And then the second issue is as you continue to go out, if you can go out 100 feet, uh, you end up in the eelgrass, which becomes a regulatory issue. So um, just as the council considers how much effort that's going to go into this, I think we're going to come back to the same issue, whether we try to improve the boat ramp where it's at, which is property owned by St. George's, the town, and Fish and Wildlife, you end 100 feet out into the water and you end up in the eelgrass. And the same thing happens at the mouth of the Mayford River. And Mr. Seipel is absolutely correct. It's the only ramp on the east side there. Um, but I, I, I just think the beach itself, Third Beach, just isn't going to cooperate with us to have deep enough water to launch a boat well, unless it's, you know, a, a flat bottom. 13-foot whaler or Carolina skiff or something. It just doesn't lend itself to that. Whereas if you launch at Fort Adams, you know, you have a, a, a sharp drop-off and, and a short ramp. Uh, or if you go out to Wheeler Cove, you've got a, a long ramp because you've got to get from the high elevation of the land down to the water. But again, you've got a significant amount of pitch that allows you to launch that bigger boat. And I think we, we heard that. Uh, a number of you are on the council when we heard those those meetings. So. Um, I just I just wanted to add that part to the discussion um, on the beach building and I've talked to Paul a little bit about this and it's something that would come back from the planning department to the council um, at one of the meetings in February there is an EDA grant that we identified um, that would pay for uh, design work for uh, the beach building it's it's COVID money that's targeted at tourism basically trying to mitigate uh, you know, situations where tourism was negatively impacted by COVID. And obviously, uh, we spent an entire season unable to operate the building, not only because we couldn't house the employees in it, but we couldn't staff or allow people to use the, uh, the restroom facilities. Uh, we don't have changing rooms, which is a, a real customer service piece. But uh, my suggestion is that I work with Ron to get that on in the next docket and that the council consider that the work the Beach Commission wants to do, we can actually fund with that grant 
Um, we'd have to talk to our federal delegation to get some support, but I am fairly confident that uh, EDA would uh, look favorably upon the application. Okay. Um, Dennis. Thank you, Mr. President. What was the, uh, I know we looked into this before, and it got, there was a number that came out, what it would take to replace that pavilion. No. no. What, did, we ever get, did we ever get to that level? We did. Uh, it was, a, uh, uh, I'm going to say 18 million, but I, I'm not, you know, I, I know there was a number, yes. Uh, our, the uh, RKG Associates report did have a number with it. It was pretty substantial. Okay. And he, it seemed low, actually, based on the amount the state built or spent on Matunic, which, which is similar in, to what we wanted to do. But it was up there. It was, it was okay. pretty far up there. Okay, thank you. And if I can just follow up on what Sean said, and, and we understand the ramp issue. I mean, I, I, there's no question. We've looked at this. We did a ramp study back in 2006 where we did depths and we tried to see what we could do. And, and it may be that we look at this and it's not worth it. I mean, it may be we, don't, we pick up six inches. Well, that's not going to do anybody any good. So if we couldn't come up with a way to come up with, with a foot of, of extra depth, then uh, we, I would say forget about it. You know, it is what it is. We can't deal with the contour of the beach. And unless we want to move it someplace, we're done. But even if we did and we had to go out that 100 feet, we still have a problem because of the eelgrass. And the eelgrass bed actually uh, is much better than it was back when we did our last study, the eelgrass bed, yeah. which is a good thing. I, I'm, I know I like it. Well, I don't like so it. Let me well. ask you, did you guys entertain <laughs> the thought, Bill, of of increase, if something was done with the boat ramp, the increased boat traffic down there? Um, because I'll tell you, the only reason I asked that question is because that probably would happen, would be my guess. And number two is that um, anytime we've tried to make any type of improvements down Third Beach, man, we, we get stonewalled by, <laughs> we get the emails and everything we get, it's like just yeah. leave it as uh, natural as possible. Oh, I know, I, I get it. That's why you know, we've backed off on a lot of things. Where, you yeah. know, I mean, all it really is is improving the ramp. And would, would boat traffic increase a lot? I don't think so, and the reason why I don't think so is the improvement in the ramp is not gonna make it like Sean said, like a Ford Adams or a Weaver Cove or anything like that. We're not gonna get there, it's not possible. So you're gonna have a, a better ramp for our residents, a better ramp for emergency purposes, hopefully. But would that, want, would that have people come from all over to go down there and use it? No, I don't think so. Plus, the way we monitor the beach now, it's not the attraction it used to be. You can't have a bunch of uh, rowdy boaters down there anymore because we don't allow non-residents <laughs> to be as part of the beach. So right. the, the amount of people that we let in there has changed. Oh, Jesus. Well, the, the, the non the people with boats can be non-residents. Yes, they can. But what, what would happen in the past was they would come down to party, and there would be a lot of other cars coming right. in to join them. Right. Okay. Mr. Welch. No. Nope. Charlene. Charlene. Can you hear us, Charlene? I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We can now. Okay, thank you. At the last meeting, um, one of our members talked to C uh, DEM, and DEM um, thinks it's time we redo the building, we upgrade the building. So just to put that out. And we, um, Bill, if I'm not mistaken, CRMC and DEM said we really don't have to go before them as long as we keep to the blueprint, the 25% blueprint. Yeah, the other, and the other report said that also. If you don't exceed that 25%, and there's certain other things you, you don't do, uh, <coughs> minor, then you don't have to, it's, approval is not, you have to get approval, but it's not something that's gonna cause a lot of grief. It's if you go beyond that 25% expansion, uh, or you add a lot more plumbing, or you add a lot more <laughs> electrical that they get upset about. Well, personally, Bill, just, Myself, I'd be. Int I'm not interested in the boat ramp. I am because I think we're gonna. We're not really gonna. What kind of money is gonna go in there to to, to gain six inches or even a foot? You know, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. I don't have any numbers, but something tells me 
it doesn't make sense, but I don't have all the facts. As far as the building goes, I think Sean should come back with us with something uh, grant-wise or whatever, as long as, as long as it, you know, doesn't, uh, and it's different monies because it's, it's non-tax generated revenue. Right. So um, I'd like to at least see what it would look like and what it would cost. Right, and I think that's why we, we sort of said we should push it now because we knew that there's money available through COVID and other places that's going to dry up eventually just like, you know, state aid for schools and stuff. It's, if it's there, you can take use of it, but if it, it, it's going to go away. There's no question about that. Yep. Okay. Is everyone, everyone okay with that? Yeah, sure. Any interest in the boat, Mr. Welch? Um, yeah, so with respect to the boat ramp, I remember listening to it before, I think it was in open space and fields, we wanted to add the dock next to it. And kind of where Paul was going, um, I didn't realize that until I looked what you were proposing to or, or have done in the past. Um, I think my concern was doing exactly that, bringing in a lot more boaters because now you can get a bigger boat in and out of there easier rather than the locals that know you don't go at low, low tide, you know. But I have no problem looking at it again and coming up, you know, how hard is it to come back and say we can get this much better a, a product for this, you know, input? I, I would look at that. And as far as the uh, building goes, <laughs> I am all for the fact that the, the beach continually and always hopefully will make money for the town. And if the infrastructure needs to be upgraded, it should get it. Or we should at least look at it, yes. I'm going to go look at both of them, I guess. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank that you, Mr. E President. You're welcome. That was easy. And committing members. Okay. Thank you guys for your work. Oh, Mr. President? Mr. Bagwell. There. I am muted. You can hear you, Mr. Bagwell. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Okay. <clears throat> John Bagwell, 587 Truckerman Avenue. And uh, I've stayed with this all night long, and it does seem like, a, as Bill Seiple said, a pretty small issue compared to the, uh, to the one you're considering for these schools. But it is nevertheless an issue that stirs up a lot of interest among people and families, especially who use Third Beach. And uh, you asked maybe why I'm participating in this thing, why I have something to say. Well. For two reasons. Number one, I was on the comprehensive plan committee that uh, uh, focused on how they wanted, how it wanted the uh, to uh, Third Beach to be developed. And I sent you uh, an email tonight that basically uh, said that the goal of the uh, of the uh, of at least the comprehensive plan was to quote preserve Third Beach by maintaining the current level of use. And that's been the goal. That's probably one of the things that's brought so many people out to oppose ramps uh, that would indeed increase the amount of boat traffic. As a matter of fact, the president of the council several years ago, when I was uh, on on the uh, when I was on the beach commission and a part of the opposition to a rather major uh, infrastructure change, said to me that if I wanted to convince the council that there were people opposing this, I had to pack the chambers. So on the night the council considered it, there was 120 people in the, in the chamber, a lot of standing room. There were probably 100 people that spoke out and supported and clapped for those opposing it, and probably 15 to 20 voters that said they would like some improvements. So that basically is the background. Now, this particular proposal uh, does answer one of the questions. Uh, will it increase the boat traffic? And the answer is, based upon the proposal, there are two, there's two references to, yes, it will indeed increase the boat traffic. And that's one of the reasons that, that, that the particular plan was put in place. So then one of my questions said, well, wait a minute, launching a boat is very difficult. There's no question about it. I've done it a couple of times myself. It's a real pain in the neck and you can't, it's very hard to launch a boat and almost impossible to retrieve one at low tide. So that certainly keeps down the amount of the use of the uh, boat. And recognizing that Third Beach, the purpose of Third Beach is basically for families and for small boats, kayaks, sunfish, uh, paddle boards, that sort of thing. 
So the Harbor Master, uh, and I also sent you a quote from the Harbor Master's report in 2019. And he said, quote, we need a boat dock. If we had a boat dock, the ramp would be much safer. We need the least expensive plastic Trex dock made that meets state criteria. This dock should be mobile so that it can be removed by axle or uh, winched up on a car or on a tow truck and brought up into the parking lot every day. It does not have to be permanent. Now, for my, as far as I know, nothing was ever done with that. But something like that would at least answer one problem. The biggest problem of trying to launch a boat there is that once you get it in the water, there's a real problem tying it up to something. And I think one at least ought to investigate that particular proposal. And uh, so that basically, and I think if you keep in mind in place of uh, what the comprehensive plan says, that there be, should be uh, to maintain the current level of use, uh, you'll focus on changes that will improve the boating, small boats, and the, and, and the beach as a place for a serene beach for, the, uh, for families that enjoy it. And I think, frankly, this is one of the town's major resources. And I think that this is where less is more. Just keep that in mind as you uh, look at your alternatives in the future. So that's the thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to make a few comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bagwell. It's always nice to hear from you. <laughs> You're always it's thinking. Late sir. at night, but um, as I said, it's a pretty small uh, issue compared to what you guys are struggling with as far as schools go. So anyway. All right, John. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you bet, Terry. Oh, th yes, thank you, Mr. President. I just had a question on the the boat ramp um, action item. I understood that the pavilions, uh, Sean's going to take a look at that grant with the, through the ADA. That's awesome. Um, so what would be the, the uh, finding or the task for the ramp? Like you've got the soft sand that the beach is just naturally keeps putting there and you've got the seagrass. I think Warren Hall needs to sit with the committee and and look at the profiles that have been taken. Um, if they want to redo the profiles to see if they've changed, um, that may be something they want to undertake as the weather warms up. Uh, but I think, you know, basically the topography is the overriding factor, you know, to the problem. Because uh, if you can't get that draft, I think uh, you, you're, you're you know, the incremental improvement's not really gonna change the situation for a boater. I just wanted to know what that looked like, the task. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. That boat ramp was built by Johnny Cake. Yep. And that boat ramp, the way he did it was to keep the majority of the water out was junk cars. <laughs> He'd probably be locked up today for doing something like that, but that's how he did it. And the excess water was pumped out and they, they did what they had to do to, to, to get the cement down and that's probably why some of the, but I mean, you know, there's not a pitch there, but if there's an appetite to check it out, let's check it out and see what we can do. All they can say is that's not gonna work. So, okay. All right, so uh, thank you very much and thank you for, your, for showing up and uh, um, you know, hearing, hearing the, the school bond as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, number 16, at the request of Open Space and Fields Committee Resolution of the Council in reference to for the celebration of the 52nd annual anniversary, rather, of Earth Day uh, 2022 celebration, declaring the week of April 16, 2022 to April 23, 2022 as Aquitic Island War, uh, Earth Week. Motion to pass said resolution. Second. I have a motion to second to pass. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. let's move on to town council business memorandum of Council Von Villas in reference to proposed amendment to short term rental ordinance. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. I have a motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, please note uh, Mr. Regan is recusing. Let me just read the Anybody motion. Else? Dennis? Yes, you're recusing. Yeah. You're recusing? Well, no, it's a state issue. Okay. Terry, are you recusing or are you staying in on this? I'll stay in on this. Fine. Okay. Um, I'll send a form in. Oh, okay. 
Motion to prorate the short-term rental fees for previously registered in 2021-22 registration year, if filed and completed, including payment by April of 2022. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? So I, I still need to have the solicitor or the conflict solicitor draft an ordinance. Okay. So I'll, I'll bring that yeah. for the next meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank yep. you. 18. Well, Number 18, amendment to the rules of the council in reference to procedure for hybrid meetings. Motion to approve said amendment to the rules of the council. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Boards and committee. Number 19. Appointment of one member of the Open Space and Fields Committee for a term expiring November 2024. Motion to appoint Thomas D. O'Neill to the Open Space and Fields Committee for a term expiring November 2024. Second. A motion is second to appoint Thomas O'Neill to the Open Space and Fields Committee for a term expiring November 2024. Any further discussion? Amen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to no, adjourn. No, before we do. What? All this paperwork. Do we have to bring it next time, or are you going to reprint everything again? For what? That's for the, uh, the opera money. Oh. Opera, no, the rescue. Keep that, I'm not going to reprint that. Okay, excellent. Oh, thank you. All right. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Aye. thank you, everyone.